You draw a presumption from certain facts. Now, th that definition would apply to legal presumption. Because you talk about presumption, it could either be a legal presumption or, or uh, simply an inference, where you are made to draw a conclusion from certain facts. But if it's a legal presumption, as what is uh, enumerated in the rules, uh, it is an assumption of fact from a given, that is drawn from a given set of facts which the law requires you to draw or to make. It is in, exact, uh, in the nature of a conclusion or an inference that you, conclusion, an inference that you draw from a given set of facts. Now, under the rules, it all rules legal presumption it all. Now, what is the effect of a legal presumption? We say that the law requires you to draw uh, a legal presumption from certain facts where this, any of these presumptions would apply. Now, where any of these presumptions, as provided for in the rules, would apply to a given set of facts, ha? pag nag-apply yan, you already create a prima facie case. Ha? That, so that is the effect of a legal presumption. Remember kahapon sabi natin, kailangan the person uh, having the burden of proof ha? must present evidence to satisfy the burden of proof. Once that burden of proof is satisfied, he shall have created, and he shall have created a prima facie case in his favor. Huh? And that would suffice to support his case. If he has created a prima facie case in his favor, that would suffice to support his case. Huh? Or if the prosecution is able to establish a prima facie case, huh? it would suffice for conviction of the accused. Unless, an only exception is if it is overcome, if it is overturned by contrary evidence. In which case, di ba sabi natin, na satisfy yung burden of proof, ha? the burden of evidence now is shifted to the other party. Now, remember the have one? Okay. Because the burden of proof does not shift. You know, you, you, that you should not forget. The burden of proof does not shift. It remains with the person asserting the affirmative until he shall have created a prima facie case in his favor. Pag natapos yan, rest easy muna siya. Huh? Because now the burden of moving forward with the evidence, the burden of destroying this is now uh, uh, shifted to the other party precisely to destroy whatever prima facie case may have been created by the proponent. Because pag hindi niya na meet, ha, hindi niya na overcome, hindi niya na destroy yung prima facie case na yon, he loses. And this one was created a prima facie case, wins the case. Now, in relation to the legal presumption, sabi natin, once, ha? Hindi, hindi natin sabi pala, sabi ng jurisprudence. <laughs> Sorry. Ha? According to jurisprudence, once you make use properly, ha? You, you, you properly make use of or you properly apply a legal presumption, 
that is provided for in the rules. Uh, if it is properly applied in a given case, tama na yon to create a prima facie case because these are disputable. A prima facie case, disputable case yan eh. Ha? Kaya nga, once you make use of a presumption as provided in the rules, sufficient na yan in the meantime. Now, burden of evidence now shifts to the other party to dispute. Disputable eh. Pag hindi na dispute yan, pag hindi na negate yan, and the prima facie case that you have created by virtue of your having a bill properly of a legal presumption, you win the case. Gets nyo? So, itong legal presumption would take the place uh, of, and would suffice for creating a prima facie case in favor of the proponent. Okay, now, what are these presumptions? Alam naman ninyo, dalawa under the rules. You have the conclusive presumption, you have the uh, disputable presumption. Huh? Yung conclusive presumptions, dalawa lang yan. Huh? Uh, estoppel in bias or estoppel by conduct and estoppel against tenant. Huh? Alam niyo naman, estoppel, you are stuck. Huh? You are stuck. For example, estoppel by conduct. I make everybody believe huh, that Mr. X is my uh, is my uh, let's say agent. Huh? And because uh, you know very well if somebody uh, is is a person's agent, he acts for in behalf of the alleged principal. Now, I I, I make you believe that Mr. X huh, is my agent and therefore you, for, exa for example, you enter into the transaction with Mr. X believing that he is my agent and believing that since he is my agent, whatever acts he does huh, will bind me, the principal, because I made you believe by my conduct, by my declaration, by my acts, I made you believe that he is my agent. Therefore, the transaction with Mr. X, huh? if there is failure in the transaction, I cannot deny. I am stopped huh? from denying that presumption which has already been created by virtue of my conduct. Estoppel in pa is estoppel by conduct. Uh, okay, please the man estoppel against tenant. Uh, you entered into a lease contract with somebody. Huh? You cannot later, you, so by, by doing so, so uh, you recognize, uh, you recognize na siya may authority to actually lease the property to you. Huh? Tapos subsequently somebody will come and you will refuse to pay to him. And you will say, ah, hindi naman pala ikaw ang owner, so I will refuse to pay. Huh? You are already a stop because you cannot, you know, you entered into the transaction, huh? Because you recognize the authority of this landlord. Huh? You are already stopped. Itong conclusive, there are only two conclusive presumptions, huh? it cannot be rebutted. It is only the disputable presumptions that can be rebutted. Kasi nga disputable. Okay, now, as I've always been saying, huh, most of this disputable presumptions you already know as you have already encountered them in various laws that you have studied okay for example this there is a presumption of innocence that is in fact constitutionally enshrined presumption of innocence another example he who is in possession disputable of that who is in possession of a recently stolen article is presumed to be the author of the theft he who is in possession, hindi nga but it's the same uh, by analogy, he who is in uh, possession of uh, a falsified document is presumed to be disputable at that, presumed to be the author of the falsification. Nandito pa rin dito yung mga uh, uh, presumption in favor of matrimony, uh, presumption uh, of survivorship, uh, yung diba yung between ages, uh, between male and female who will survive, Ha, it will be down the male. This is chauvinist. Ha, but you know, it will it will be as between if they uh, they uh, involve uh, let's say they drown who, who is presumed to have survived. It is the male that or uh, between the older and the younger. It is the younger. Ha, okay. So it when you have encountered this. Um, Ito acquiescence, no? Resulted from a belief that the thing acquiesced in was conformable to law or fact. Now, uh, yung presumption in favor of legitimacy. Huh? Presumption in favor of legitimacy. Now, 
um, you may say, ang haba naman yan. Huh? You're not expected to memorize. Huh? But as I've always been saying, you're not expected to memorize all these presumptions. Kasi hindi naman yan exclusive eh. There's the other uh, presumptions. For as long as it is, it is disputable in nature. You're not expected to memorize, but you're expected to me remember. Huh? And therefore, memorize. At least for purposes of the bar. Huh? In a indulge naman yan eh, most in civil law, in commercial law, huh? that the uh, uh, yung the money paid by one to another was due to the other. Okay, now, let me just uh, call your attention to, please, uh, makalimabas, the doctrine of conflicting presumptions. Huh? Doctrine of conflicting presumptions. Under the doctrine of conflicting presumptions, uh, the, greater, uh, the greater presumption, huh? the stronger, sorry, the stronger presumption, huh? overcomes the weaker presumption. In case of conflict, in other words, between two presumptions, huh, the stronger presumption must prevail uh, or must overcome the weaker presumption. Remember, um, I gave us an example. For example, a man and a woman, huh, they act as if they are married. Uh, but they are not because the man is married. The woman is married. Okay. In a prosecution for adultery, uh, in a prosecution for adultery, there is one disputable presumption that a man and a woman deporting themselves as husband and wife have entered into a lawful, uh, have lawfully entered into a marriage contract. That there is such a presumption. Sabi natin ganina, it is a presumption in favor of matrimony. Now, these two people are prosecuted now for adultery because the woman is married uh, and she's having SI with a man other than her husband. That is, they're both prosecuted for adultery. Okay. But there is a presumption that a man and a woman deporting themselves as husband and wife. Huh? have lawfully entered in a contract. If you, marriage contract, if you make use of this presumption, na, if you make use of this presumption, then it will lead to their conviction. Kasi nga, they're acting as if. So, totoo, na, that they may have had uh, sexual relations. Na? So, if you're making use of it, it will render them guilty if you make use of this presumption. But this is a legal presumption that is disputable. There is, since this is a criminal prosecution, there is, on the other hand, a presumption in favor of the innocence of the accused. Correct? Huh? And that presumption is constitutionally enshrined. Therefore, as between a presumption disputable at that, which is a statutory presumption as provided for in the rules, as against a constitutional presumption which would prevail constitutional presumption of innocence. Huh? Tapos ito naman, statutory presumption, disputable presumption, huh? that would render them guilty huh? of adultery, which should prevail. And we should bring you stronger presumption, which is huh? presumption of innocence. Why stronger? Huh? Why stronger to which the, uh, uh, the, the, the weaker presumption should yield? Now, why strong? Because precisely, it is constitutionally enshrined. Huh? So, in case of, titignan uh, ninyo yung nature of the presumption. In case of conflict, huh? under the doctrine of conflicting presumptions, in case of conflict huh, between presumptions, the stronger presumption should prevail over the weaker presumption. Okay. Okay, now, very important. Ito, let me call your attention to this because this is very important. Uh, section 3 of Rule 133, extrajudicial confession is not sufficient ground for conviction. Huh? Ang tatandaan lang ninyo, as far as this provision is concerned, if a person 
uh, makes an extrajudicial confession. Even if that extrajudicial, sorry, extrajudicial confession, he owns up to the commission of the crime. Mm. Huh? He owns up to the commission of the crime. Okay, I, I, he, he goes to the police station, he executes an extrajudicial confession, and says that he was the one who killed Mr. X. Okay, now, that alone, huh, even if that extrajudicial confession was voluntarily made with the assistance of a lawyer, therefore it is constitutionally compliant, Huh? Even if that extrajudicial confession is constitutionally compliant, meaning it has complied with all the requirements of the Constitution and the law for purposes of its validity, huh? that will not be the uh, and that will not be the sole basis of his conviction. In other words, that cannot be huh? the basis alone of his conviction unless sabe, it is corroborated by evidence of corpus delicti. Please, uh, while we literally translate corpus delicti as body of the crime. Uh, so, pag sinabi natin corpus delicti, in the rules and evidence, uh, corpus delicti literally means body of the crime. Uh, however, in jurisprudence, ang concept, please, ng corpus delicti, is, it does not refer to the object itself. Uh, corpus delicti is the fact of the commission of the crime. Very important. Huh? Corpus delicti is the fact of the commission of the crime. Now, in relation to this provision, tandaan lang ninyo, even if a person owns up to the commission of the crime, huh? nagtatatangan siya, sabi niya, ako, ako ang pumatay. For as long as the fact of the killing has not been established, he cannot be convicted solely on that. Yun lang yun. Huh? So, so uh, what if talagang trip lang niya? Uh, because mas masarap sa jail. Libre ang food. Libre ang, libre ang, ang, ang housing. Uh, ang libre lahat. Uh, so, he cannot be convicted solely on the basis of his confession. Yun lang ang message dyan. Uh, but it, in, the, in other words, the crime that he's confessing to uh, must first be established. The fact. Uh, of the crime allegedly committed must first be established. Okay. As far as circumstantial evidence is concerned, please know, uh, most cases, if you notice, uh, most convictions, uh, if you read uh, uh, decision, uh, decisions, most convictions are uh, based on circumstantial evidence. Kasi pag sinabi, as the same from direct evidence, there is direct evidence, uh, usually that is the eyewitness account. Uh, direct evidence. I, I saw the accused do it. Uh, he killed the victim. Okay. It is an eyewitness account that is the direct evidence. Uh, okay. Remember dun sa claim run ninyo, there is no other direct for purposes of discharge. Uh, there is no other direct evidence available other than the testimony of this person of this accused who is sought to be discharged, yung direct testimony, that is direct evidence. Ha? Kasi siya ang nandun, he can very well testify on the circumstances. That's why the prosecution uh, seeks for his discharge for him to testify for the prosecution. Yun yun. Ha? So, most convictions, if they do not have any eyewitness account, uh, eyewitness account, uh, the court will have to uh, depend on circumstantial evidence. That is why the court would have to be very careful. Kailangan please pang-memorize ninyo yung elements or requisites of circumstantial evidence to suffice for conviction. Number one, there must be more than one circumstance. Number two, the facts from which the inferences are derived are proven. And number three, a combination of all the circumstances is such as to produce a conviction beyond reasonable doubt. Please, uh, all this in order for circumstantial. Remember, pag circumstantial, the court would simply have to draw Ha? So, kailangan maganda ang basis, solid basis, because the court is going to draw a conclusion of guilt, is going to draw ha, from this circumstances. That is why, number one, circumstantial evidence, there must be more than one circumstance. Ha? For example, ha? as I've always been given, parang illustrative example, a witness says he saw on the date of the incident, 
and within the time of the incident, he saw the accused running away from the scene of the crime. That is one insta uh, one circumstance that is related or referred uh, attributed to the accused. The witness says, on the date and time of the alleged incident, he saw the accused running away from the scene of the crime. You cannot, the court cannot draw a conclusion from that it, because it could be that he is uh, running away because he feared. Huh? He feared for his life. It could be that he was running away because he didn't want to get involved. So many reasons. So the court cannot draw a conclusion of guilt from that single circumstance. Okay, next. The way, another witness says, on the date and time in question, he saw the accused running away from the scene of the crime, carrying a blooded bolo. <laughs> another witness says, he saw the accused running away from the scene of the crime, carrying a blooded bolo with blood splattered all over his bitch t-shirt. <laughs> okay, so that's when I end. Okay, now, can the court more than one circumstance can the court already draw a conclusion not yet huh? for purposes of conviction sabi natin all these circumstances huh? all these circumstances kind of more than one but all these circumstances must first have to be proved huh? because it's so easy to allege huh? you cannot draw an inference, huh? you cannot draw an inference from mere allegations. For purposes of circumstantial evidence, you cannot draw an inference of guilt from mere allegations. You cannot draw an inference of guilt from another inference, but that would be double opinion. Huh? You can only, for purposes of circumstantial evidence to suffice for conviction, you must draw an inference of guilt only from facts which have been proven. Huh? Kahit marami yan, if the facts alleged by different witnesses huh, have not been proven, kahit na nagko-corroborate, you cannot, and the court cannot draw an inference of guilt for purposes of circumstantial evidence to suffice for conviction. Gets nyo? Yun ang importante. Kailangan the inference must be drawn from facts which have been proven. Okay. Yung perpetration of testimony, ah, that is already part of uh, uh, that's rule 24 already huh, of the rules on civil procedure. Huh, that is deposition, uh, before action, or pending appeal. Huh? Deposition uh, in perpetuum rei memoria. Hmm? Okay, so hindi na natin i-discuss yan. Let me just, um, I think I missed out on, uh, uh, no, no, I did not miss out on the different kinds of questions, huh? You're leading, misleading. I mentioned that yesterday, no? And I mentioned continuing objection, no? Uh, it's a good time to Wait, uh, before we conclude with evidence. <laughs> 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 Okay, very important. Uh, impeachment, how is a witness? Uh, because this has been qualified in a recent decision by the Supreme Court. Uh, how do you impeach a witness by evidence of prior inconsistent statement? This is very important because there's a recent case on this where the Supreme Court qualified. No? If, okay, if a witness, you know that the witness may, uh, okay, the witness makes a, a statement in court. You know that a witness in another proceeding made a statement which is inconsistent. Now, before he testified in court, this witness made a statement which is inconsistent with his present statement that he makes in court. Huh? So, 
how do you impeach him? Huh? Because if you present to the court huh, the inconsistent statements, you are able to call attention to the court that this particular person has made a statement before huh, that is inconsistent with the statement he's now making before this court. Huh? Not necessarily my impeachment credibility. Huh? Because if he makes uh, uh, inconsistencies on material points of his testimony, that will je uh, definitely affect his credibility. Huh? And you would have impeached him. Now, but the Supreme Court has qualified, huh? not, not really qualified, explained. Because under the rules, huh? if, you, uh, if you are trying to impeach a witness, by evidence that he made a prior inconsistent statement or by evidence that on a prior occasion he has made an inconsistent statement, number one, you first have to confront laying the predicate down. You first have to confront the witness with such previous statement, huh? ask him if he, really, if he really made that statement. Huh? If he made that statement, diba? Lalabas, you have already impeached him because it is inconsistent. Now, the Supreme Court said, no, hold it. Huh? Even if you have shown and the witness has already acknowledged the fact that on a prior occasion, he has made a statement which is inconsistent with his present testimony, you have to give the witness an opportunity to explain huh? the inconsistency. That is what I was thinking. Huh? Why, why, that is already trial technique. Why would you still give him an opportunity to explain? Huh? When he already made an inconsistent statement. That already affects his credibility. Because in jurisprudence, huh, in jurisprudence, uh, the, the Supreme Court in, in many cases said that if he makes, if a witness makes inconsistencies on material points of his testimony, that is what, that would be adverse to his credibility. So in this particular case, however, in the Banyan Supreme Court, you are now trying to lay the predicate. Huh? That's a prior inconsistent statement. Huh? So, in the trial technique, tapos na, na impeach mo na. No. Sabi na Supreme Court, you first have to give the witness an opportunity to explain. After he has acknowledged that he made that inconsistent statement, you first have to give that witness an opportunity to explain what are uh, that inconsistency? It is only when the witness huh, has not has failed to give a satisfactory explanation for his inconsistency that you will be considered to have impeached the witness. Huh? And then, you know, may recent case on that day, 2009 case. Hmm? So the Supreme Court said you have to give the witness the op it's not enough therefore that you establish that you are able to see, uh, show that the witness has made inconsistent statement. Huh? You have to give the witness first an opportunity to explain the inconsistency. Once the witness, it is only when the witness has failed to give a satisfactory explanation for his inconsistency that you shall be considered to have impeached that witness. Huh? Kailangan may prior explanation. Now, if you are, uh, sabi nga niya, one of the exceptions, uh, one of the exceptions, uh, the rule is, with respect to your witness, you cannot impeach your witness. Sandan niya na, you cannot impeach your own witness. That is the rule. Uh, however, if he is a hostile witness, uh, you can impeach him. The rule is you cannot impeach your own witness. The exception being that if he is a hostile witness, then you may impeach him. That's the exception. Why do you say you may impeach? Uh, yeah, because please take note that hostile witness, hostile witness, Hostile witness, he is still your witness. But he is your witness only because you called him to the witness stand. Na? I'm calling to the witness stand, Mr. X, Your Honor, and I'm presenting this witness as a hostile witness. Na? So, he is your witness. Na? But basically, na, essentially, magkalaban tayo. But since you were the one you called, who called him to the witness stand, as in fact, you would want to utilize it as your witness, he is your witness. Huh? But since he is your witness, the rule is you cannot impeach your own witness. Di ba? But 
that is an exception. Kasi, kaya mo lang siya tinawag to testify. Ha? To testify. So, he is your witness. It ends there. Ha? His being your witness ends there once you have called him and he's sworn in ha? to testify. Because, now, because basically, magkalaban tayo ng interest and therefore, you may him teach him. But the rule is, you, basta witness mo, you cannot impeach your own witness. Uh, except, uh, if he's a witness for the other party or uh, he is a hostile witness. Now, next point. Uh, before a witness, however, can be allowed to uh, testify uh, as a hostile witness, uh, and therefore, pag hostile witness, number one, you can propound leading questions. Ha? Pag was tayo witness, you can propound leading questions. No? Before you can be allowed to testify as a hostile witness, and therefore you can already be, uh, you can already uh, uh, propound leading questions, you can already impeach him, ha? he must first be, uh, the court must first be convinced. Ha? Must, the court must first be convinced that he is really hostile to your cause. That is why you are allowed to propound leading questions to a hostile witness. Kasi alam niya magkalaban tayo. And most uh, often than not, huh? and most often than not, that witness who is called to the witness stand, he knows na magkalaban tayo. So, you cannot extract anything from him. That is why you are allowed to propound leading questions to him. Ha? Kasi magka-clam up yan. Sisibangutan ka pa niya. Dahil alam niya, magkalaban kayo. So you cannot uh, extract anything from him. That is why if you are using him as a hostile witness, you have to, you may be allowed to propound. But before ha, you can uh, impeach this witness, you can... Uh, uh, then you, you can allow, uh, the court can allow this witness, the court would have to be convinced of the antagonism uh, between your causes, and you have to first wait for a declaration from the court that he is indeed a hostile witness. Without that, indeed, we'll quit. Hmm? Look, one last point. A witness may be allowed, in the course of his testimony, a witness may be allowed to refer to a memorandum. Huh? Important ito. A witness may be, in the course of his testimony, a witness may be allowed to refer to a memorandum. The purpose of refer referring to a memorandum is only to refresh his memory. Huh? Number one, the purpose to refer to a memorandum is to refresh his memory, the memory of the witness. Number two, uh, what is the memorandum contemplated huh? under the rules? It is not any formal memorandum. Memorandum on appeal, a parent's memorandum, etc. That's not the memorandum that is contemplated. The memorandum that is contemplated under the rules uh, to which the witness may refer to uh, to refresh his memory is yung parang consisting of even informal notes. Huh? Uh, commonly, huh? yung mga notes ng police, if the police is the one testifying. For example, if the policeman uh, responds to a call for assistance, there's a crime that has been committed, the policeman goes to the crime scene, he conducts an ocular inspection, he takes that notes of what he saw, uh, and then he interviews witnesses at the crime scene, he interviews, he takes down uh, their statements. Okay, those are his notes. Uh, informal notes like that. Those are his notes. Now, after that, years after, months after, huh, there will be a prosecution. Now, he will be called to his witness stand since he cannot remember everything because he's investigated a lot of cases. Huh, he may now refer to his notes. Yun yung memorandum that is contemplated in the rules. Now, number, number three, before, however, a witness can refer to his memorandum, to his notes, he must first ask the permission of the court. Huh? Your Honor, may I please refer to my notes? Kasi hindi pa pwede na, while testifying, you are reading from your notes. You will be questioned. Uh, it just happened uh, a week ago in our court. 
ha? The, the lawyer was supposed to be cited for contempt. Ha? In fact, I think he was cited for contempt. Kasi pareho sila, it was scripted. It is a, but you know, he simply, he is simply referring to his notes. That is not a memorandum as contemplated. Sabi ng isang justice. Ha? Which is correct naman. Kasi we got a copy from the lawyer. Tapos, we got a copy from the witness. Pareho zinerox lang. Ha? Tapos, no. Huh? Uh, ask the court to get uh, the evidence. Uh, scripted talaga. Uh, that is not the memorandum. Okay, now if you want to refer to the memorandum, the only purpose is to refresh your memory. Next point. Is this memorandum admissible in evidence? Huh? Is this memorandum that is referred to by the witness admissible in evidence? No. That memorandum is not admissible in evidence. Huh? What is admissible in evidence? Because self-serving yung personal lang yan. Okay. What is admissible in evidence is the testimony of the witness. Huh? After his memory has been refreshed, by reference to those notes. So the notes themselves, the memorandum itself is not admissible in evidence. It is the testimony of the witness after his memory has been refreshed by reference to those notes that is admissible in evidence. That's now. Okay. Do you have any questions on evidence? <laughs> Uh, okay, if you if you don't want to raise your questions, at least isulat ninyo so we can ano talaga. Uh, at least isulat ninyo because I know you are shy. Uh, okay, now, I'll go now to provisional remedies. As you well know, there are only five provisional remedies. Yeah? Rule 57 is uh, attach preliminary attachment, 58, preliminary injunction, 59, receivership, 60, replevin, 61, support pendente lite. Okay, now, this provisional remedy are, uh, are uh, availed of in both civil and criminal cases. Kaya lang, dun sa criminal cases, as you know, in your uh, crime pro, any of these provisional remedies are likewise available. Huh? Are likewise available in criminal cases, pero may qualification. They, this uh, provisional remedies are available and may be availed of only in so far as they are applicable. Huwag niyong kakalimutan yun. Huh? Because lima lang ang provisional remedies in the rules. Preliminary attachment, preliminary injunction, receivership, uh, replevin, and support pendente lete under Rule 61. Huh? Okay, so this, according to the rules, this are used, generally ito gamit sa civil cases. Huh? But they may likewise be availed of huh, in criminal cases. Pero may qualification. Only in so far as they are applicable. As I said, for example, you cannot avail of support pendente lite in a prosecution for stapa. Huh? You cannot ask the court to please direct the accused to support me in the meantime because he dealt me. Huh? Pending his conviction. Hindi pwede. It is not applicable. So only in so far as they are applicable. Next point. When do you avail of these provisional remedies? Preliminary attachment, preliminary injunction, you avail of these remedies at any time before judgment. Huh? Preliminary attachment, preliminary injunction, you avail of these remedies at any time before judgment. Huh? Receivership, uh, you avail of this uh, provisional remedy even after judgment. Why? You go to the purpose of receivership. What is the purpose of receivership? To preserve the property in litigation and to protect 
the interest of the parties to the litigation. Okay? So receivership even after judgment. Huh? Replevin, you avail of replevin at any time before the defendant files his answer. Huh? At any time before the defendant files his answer. What about support pendente lite? As the name suggests, support pendente lite at any time before judgment. Huh? It is support during or pending the litigation. Okay. Now, what should you remember as far as preliminary attachment is concerned? Number one, take note of the nature of preliminary attachment. It is a contingent lien on the property of the defendant. Uh, it's a burden uh, on the property of the defendant uh, to answer uh, for, uh, to, uh, for the satisfaction of the judgment which plaintiff may obtain uh, at, at the end of the action of a favorable judgment that the plaintiff. So, dyan ka muna, ikaw ang magsasatisfy. In the event the plaintiff uh, in, uh, in the event the plaintiff obtains a favorable judgment, that property uh, on way, uh, which has already been attached, where there is already a contingent lien, uh, will be the one to answer for the satisfaction of that judgment. So it is in the nature of a contingent lien on the property of the defendant to answer for the satisfaction of any favorable judgment that the plaintiff may obtain. Now, you grant, uh, so we said, when do you file a, an application for preliminary attachment at any time, be, uh, either at the commencement of the action or at any time before judgment. Next, maraming grounds, no? Uh, in, in, in Rule 57. Maraming grounds for attachment. Let me just uh, call your attention to new grounds, uh, to some grounds which, which are important. Hmm? Before the revision of the rules, fraud as a ground for preliminary attachment is only fraud in contracting the obligation. Yeah? Now, fraud as a ground for a writ of preliminary attachment is both fraud not only in contracting the obligation, but likewise fraud in the performance of the obligation. Huh? Fraud in the performance of the obligation. Yung fraud in contracting, let's say, uh, from the time you, let's say, you borrowed money, huh? after borrowing money, umalis ka na. Huh? You, you disappeared altogether. So even from the beginning, at the time you contracted, you never intended huh? to pay your obligation. So there was fraud in contracting the obligation. Now, ngayon kasama na ang fraud in the performance of the obligation. Now, uh, in relation, let's say, that, um, so fraud in the performance of the obligation. Which means that before the revision of the rules, uh, preliminary attachment on the ground of fraud in the performance of, uh, on, the ground, on the ground of fraud, uh, uh, is not available in a prosecution for stop -up by issuance of a rubber check under Article 315, Paragraph 2D of the Revised Penal Code. Stapa by issuing or post-dating a rubber check. Di ba meron yan? Okay, Article 315, Paragraph 2D of the Revised Penal Code. In that particular prosecution, huh, you cannot avail of a writ of preliminary attachment on the ground of fraud. Why? Kasi ang fraud pa lang noon is fraud in contracting the obligation. Huh? Now, bakit sabi natin now you can already avail of writ of preliminary attachment on the ground of fraud? Huh? Because now, pwede na yung fraud in the performance of the obligation. Why so? Because, remember, when you issue a check, huh? you issue a check in payment of an obligation, correct? Huh? If I don't know, because it's gray area there. Huh? So, I'm presenting this to you. You issue a check in payment of an obligation. Now, hindi ba in your civil law? When you pay, you perform. Correct? Okay. So, when you issue a check in payment of, and therefore, in the performance of the obligation, nag-bounce yung check, eh? prosecuted for stop-up. Huh? 
based on that rubber check which you issued in payment of and therefore in the performance of the obligation. Nag-bounce ang check eh. In the, in the event of a prosecution for STAPA under Article 315, paragraph 2D of the Revised Penal Code, you can now avail of preliminary attachment huh? on the ground of fraud in the performance of the obligation. By the fact na nag-bounce yung check eh, which you issued in payment of and therefore, in the performance of the obligation, there was fraud in your performance of the obligation. Huh? Take note of the other. Uh, take note of the other scenario. If you issue a check in payment of, and therefore in the performance of the obligation, nag bounce and check it in a prosecution for violation of BP 22. Can you avail of a writ of preliminary attachment on the ground of fraud in the performance of the obligation? No. Why? Because fraud is not an element of BP 22. Next question. Can nevertheless, can you avail of writ of preliminary attachment on other grounds? Yes, but not on the ground of fraud in the performance of the obligation. Yes, no. Uh, another ground uh, for issuance of a writ of attachment uh, is if the action is against a party who does not reside and is not found in the Philippines or on whom summons may be served by publication. Okay. Uh, in an action, that's one of the grounds. In an action against a non-resident defendant. Yan yun eh. Na kasi, in an action against uh, a party who does not reside and is not found in the Philippines. And or, or on whom summons may be served by publication. So in an action against a non-resident defendant huh, who is not found here in the Philippines. Why may you be allowed Huh? Why? Uh, uh, under what circumstances may you be allowed to uh, avail of a writ of preliminary attachment if the action is against a non-resident who is not found in the Philippines? Ang requirement dito, even if he is a non-resident and he is not found in the Philippines, he has properties here in the Philippines. Huh? He has properties here in the Philippines which can be attached and over which the court can acquire jurisdiction. Follow niya? Mm -hmm. Kasi if the defendant is non-resident, he does not reside in the Philippines, he, he cannot be found in the Philippines, he has no properties in the Philippines, wala, the court cannot acquire jurisdiction. Our court cannot acquire jurisdiction over him. Huh? Now, how can... Uh, so, in a situation where the action is against a non-resident who is not found in the Philippines, pwede pa rin mag-proceed ang action huh? if, you, if that non-resident defendant has properties here in the Philippines huh? which can be attached. Pag wala, wala. Gets nyo? Now, Sabi niya yan, if it is a foreign corporation who is a defendant uh, in a case filed here in the Philippines, the fact that the action is against a foreign corporation that is doing business here in the Philippines, hindi ka pwede mag-avail of writ of attachment simply on the ground that it, the action is against a non-resident. Huh? Kasi for purposes of attachment, nakalagay sa ground, the action is against a non-resident who is not found in the Philippines. Okay? Uh, but he has properties here in the Philippines which can be attached. Now, if you are filing, uh, follow niya, if you are filing an action against a foreign corporation, foreign, it is not resident, correct? But that foreign corporation uh, is doing business here in the Philippines, as in fact it is licensed to do business here in the Philippines, it will not be, uh, uh, it will not be, uh, it will not be simply considered as a ground 
ha, for filing an application for writ of attachment. In other words, if the action is against a foreign corporation doing business here in the Philippines, licensed to do business in the Philippines, gusto mo mag-apply ng writ of attachment, ang ground mo is not because it is a non-resident, ang ground mo is because he is that corporation, ha, that corporation is doing other things, disposing of its properties in fraud of creditors. Other things other than the fact that it is a foreign corporation. Follow nyo? Hindi? Ha? Importante kasi yan eh. Nagkaroon ng kaso yan eh. Ha? Okay. Now, for purposes of a writ of preliminary attachment, ha? you have to post, uh, to file an affidavit and to post an attachment bond. Huh? You have to file an affidavit, affidavit and to post an attachment bond. The bond will answer for any damages, the attachment bond will answer for any damages which the, uh, the uh, uh, defendant or the person whose property has been attached uh, may sustain by reason of the attachment. That is the condition of the attachment bond. Uh, that is to be posted. Affidavit plus bond. Okay, now, sabi ganyan, uh, the attachment, uh, uh, we're talking about grounds, no? However, please remember, if the ground, uh, if, uh, uh, that's the discharge, but, uh, I'm sorry. So, affidavit plus bond. Now, next point, an a writ of preliminary attachment may be issued ex parte. Uh, it may be issued ex parte. You simply have to file an affidavit and post uh, a, an, um, uh, an attachment bond. And the court may issue it ex parte. But, please, uh, there is a case, Adlawan versus Torres, which says that uh, you do not, in your affidavit, and for purposes of an application for a writ of preliminary attachment, you do not perfunctorily use the words of the law. In other words, ha, so sabi mo lang, it is an application for attachment on the ground that there was fraud in contracting the obligation, period. No, you have to prove what are the facts constitutive of the alleged fraud. So, meron ka pala burden of proof. So, my point is, even if the law says the attachment may be issued ex parte, the applicant still has the burden of proving that he has a ground. It may be issued ex parte, correct? Ha? But, ex parte, hindi na ninonotify yan. That is what is meant by that. Eh. The other party, or the party whose property is sought to be attached, will no longer be notified. That's ex parte issuance. Ha? Of the fact that there is an application for attachment. Because uh, it will defeat the purpose. If you notify them that there is an application for a written attachment, by the time the attachment is issued, wala na property. Ha? So, attachment may be issued ex parte. But, for purposes of issuance of ex parte, ako what I do is, kasi following the ruling in Adlawan versus Torres, you, it is still, uh, the, the applicant still has the burden of proving his ground. I set it for ex parte hearing. Mm -hmm. huh? I still set it. It's not automatic on my part. Mag file an affidavit, mag post ka ng bond. Huh? File an affidavit, mag post ka ng bond, that's it. I issue an affidavit. Uh, I issue a writ. No. Huh? Because you still have a burden of proving. Remember, papakialam mo yung property of somebody else. Huh? And ex parte at that. Huh? So, you have to be very careful. I set it for ex parte hearing, and I find out that you have established your, uh, your ground, then I issue the, uh, the, uh, uh, the attachment ex parte. Hmm? That is what is meant by at, at, uh, attachment issued ex parte. Now, while a writ of attachment, huh? can be issued ex parte, which means that you do not notify, and which means that therefore, you can issue it even if the court has not as yet acquired jurisdiction over the person of the defendant. Correct? That's ex parte. Huh? Okay, so, see, upon the commencement of the action, pag file mo, may application ka huh? for ex parte, without notifying the other party, you can get a rate of preliminary attachment. So, even before the court can acquire jurisdiction over the person of the defendant, huh, a writ of attachment may be issued. The next point is, huh, can you implement the writ of attachment that has been issued ex parte without the court having as yet acquired jurisdiction over the person of the defendant? No. Magkaiba, no? 
you issue ones from implementation. Nah? You can issue it without the court having acquired jurisdiction over the person the defendant, but you cannot implement it without the court having acquired jurisdiction over the person the defendant. That is why Jan Papasuk yung doctrine of prior or contemporaneous service of summons. Nah? Do not forget that. Prior or contemporaneous. Meaning that, mauna muna must serve ang summons before you serve the writ of attachment. Na? Because it is, nima, basic naman eh, it is by virtue of the service of summons that the court acquires jurisdiction over the person to defend that. Ha? So prior, mauna muna ang service of summons before you serve the writ of attachment which has been issued ex parte or you serve them together. Simultaneous. Sabay-sabay together. Gets nyo? But it is, pag-serve mo, kakabit na doon. Ha? Yung rent of attachment, nakakabit na rin doon sa summons. Sabay. Ha? So, remember, while a rent of attachment can be issued ex parte, it, uh, without the court as, ha, having a yet acquired jurisdiction over the person the defendant, it cannot be implemented. Ha? Ex, uh, without the court having a yet acquired. That kapaso ang doctrine of prior or contemporaneous service of summons. Except, of course, huh? if, number one, summons, meron mga exceptions, no? Summons cannot be served personally or by substituted service. Huh? It is against a non-resident is not found in the Philippines. The action is in rem or quasi in rem. Hindi na magka-apply or need to apply the uh, doctrine of prior or contemporaneous service of summons. Now, let me just, be, be, before we go any further, if we relate ko lang sa injunction, the doctrine of prior or contemporaneous service of summons uh, is likewise applied in preliminary injunction. Uh, preliminary injunction, ina-apply rin na. But, where lies the difference? Tingnan ninyo. Sa preliminary attachment, uh, summons is served Huh? Summons is served huh, ahead of the attachment or summons and attachment are served together. Huh? So, uh, uh, doctrine of prior contemporary service of summons. E ang preliminary injunction, a writ of preliminary injunction, very basic, cannot be issued without prior notice and hearing. Correct? Huh? A writ of preliminary injunction cannot be issued ex parte. It is only a writ of preliminary attachment, remember, that can be issued ex parte. A writ of preliminary injunction can never be issued ex parte. There ought to be notice and hearing. So, how will you apply the doctrine of prior or contemporaneous service of someone? Huh? Hindi nga na issue So, what will you serve? together with the summons. Or what will you serve after the service of the summons? It is only the notice of hearing. Huh? It is the notice of hearing huh? plus the summons to satisfy the doctrine of prior. Kasi nga, you cannot, you cannot, uh, the writ cannot be issued huh? without notice and hearing. So magkakaroon muna ng hearing before the writ is issued. Huh? Ay, but paano pa mag-apply yung doctrine of prior contemporaneous? So, what will be served together with the uh, summons is the notice of the hearing on the application for preliminary injunction. Huwag niyo kalimutan na na, very basic and difference. Since a writ of attachment can be issued ex parte, yun ang isi-serve with the summons. But since a writ of preliminary injunction can never be issued ex parte, what will actually be served will be the summons plus the notice of the hearing on the application for a writ of preliminary injunction. Gets niya? Okay, now, going back, meron lang kung ano din, going back to, uh, to preliminary attachment, uh, how, how do you discharge? Uh, once a preliminary attachment has been issued, how do you discharge it? You either try uh, post a counter bond. Ang mag discharge niyan is the defendant whose property has been attached. Okay. You either post a counter bond or file a motion for the discharge of the attachment. On what ground? On the ground that the attachment has been irregularly issued or improperly issued, on the ground that the attachment is excessive, on the ground that the bond is insufficient. Okay, so you have two, two, two ways. 
uh, by which um, to uh, to cause a discharge of the writ of preliminary attachment. Post the counter bond or file a motion. This is a litigious motion, lah, kasi magkakaroon ng hearing yan. A motion to discharge the attachment on different grounds. Now, however, if your ground for attachment, remember this, ah, decided case na to. If your ground for attachment ah, constitutes your very cause of action in the main case, the only way that you can discharge an attachment is by posting a counterbond. Uleta, very important. Ah, kasi para, para somebody hearing lang eh on the motion to discharge the attachment. But ah, if your ground ah, for attachment ah, constitutes or is your very ground, a very cause of action in the main case. Remember, attachment is provisional remedy. Attachment yan, accessory lang yan, di ba? To the main case. So, if your ground for attachment is your very cause of action in the main case, therefore, kailangan magkaroon ng hearing on the merits. But if you want at that point to cause a discharge of the attachment where your ground is the very cause of action in the complaint, you can only discharge that attachment by posting a counterpart. For example, ang ground for attachment is fraud. Your cause of action in the main case is likewise fraud. It is the same fraud that is your cause of action. The only way you can cause a discharge of the attachment on that ground is to post a counterpart. Gets niya? Okay. How do you make a claim against the attachment bond? A claim for damages. Huh? Damages, uh, who is the one claiming? The property. For example, uh, uh, it, it, the court finally decided that the plaintiff or you applied uh, for the attachment was not entitled to it in the first place. Huh? So you can, if you sustain damages, you claim damages against the attachment bond. Uh, it's either by way of a motion in the same action, uh, or it may be uh, it may be uh, pleaded as a counterclaim in your answer. If you're the defendant whose property has been attached and who sustained damages by reason of the attachment of your property. Okay. When you go to preliminary injunction, what should you remember as far as preliminary injunction is concerned? Okay, the sole purpose of a preliminary injunction is to uh, to preserve the status quo. Huh? The last actual feasible uh, condition before the controversy. To preserve the status quo. Huh? Yeah, the status quo, sorry, the last, the uh, actual, feasible, uncontested status before the pending controversy. Now, ginagamit din yan, uh, the, uh, the purpose of a TRO is likewise to preserve the status quo, correct? Huh? E yung TRO ay pinsan ng preliminary injunction. Huh? Ang purpose nila both is to preserve the status quo. But you have to clarify. The TRO is to preserve the status quo pending determination of the propriety of issuing a preliminary injunction. Ha? A TRO is to preserve the status quo pending the determination of the propriety of issuing a preliminary injunction. A preliminary injunction is to preserve the status quo pending final judgment in the case. Uh, to preserve the status quo. Uh, stop, uh, stop muna uh, the performance of the act or the continuation in the performance of the act that is complained of. Huh? So, kita clarify nyo. They're both to preserve the status quo. But at what point? Oh, na yung TRO. Huh? Kasi urgent dyan. Remember, ang, 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 ang correlative uh, uh, um, characteristic of uh, a situation where the court can issue a TRO is urgency. Urgency. Huh? Pag may urgency, may application for TRO. 
kasi ay eh, urgent kasi it has to be stopped in the meantime kasi a, a preliminary injunction cannot be issued ex parte. There ought to be notice and hearing. And eh, what during the hearing? Meron ng damage huh? that would appear to be irreparable damage to be caused to the applicant. Huh? In damage can be caused to the applicant before the matter can be heard on notice. Eh. Diba? What is that matter? The application for preliminary injunction. That is why, huh? pending application for preliminary injunction, kailangan mag-preserve mo na status quo. Kailangan mo na ma-stop yung performance of the act that is complained of, huh? that is sought to be enjoined by virtue of the rate of preliminary, uh, uh, preliminary injunction. Issue ka muna ng TRO. Huh? And the lifetime, di ba? Ang TRO is what? 20 days. Meaning that within the 20-day lifetime of a TRO, Huh? the court would have to resolve the application for a writ of injunction. Huh? Within the 20-day lifetime of a TRO, the court would have to resolve huh? the application for a writ of preliminary injunction. If not expire your 20-day lifetime of TRO. Ito yung issued by the t- uh, trial court, no? If mag expire yung 20-day lifetime of a TRO without the court na, having, na, having issued na, a, pre- a writ of preliminary injunction, automatically left the eh. na, So, the, uh, the act is not uh, restrained anymore. Na, kasi, automatically, there is no need under the rules for a judicial declaration of the termination of the lifetime of a TRO. Automatically terminated yan after the life, uh, after the lapse of his 20-day lifetime. Huh? Or, if there is a denial of a preliminary injunction, huh? preliminary injunction, huh? lifted na rin yung TRO. Huh? So, yun lang is to preserve. Huh? Stop mo muna while it is being heard. Uh, while the application for a better preliminary injunction is being heard. Okay. Now, with respect to uh, a TRO, we said, uh, correlatively, there is urgency for purposes of application. Uh, but even if it is urgent, uh, uh, a, writ of, uh, ano, a TRO cannot be issued ex parte. Kasi nga, in the nature of injunction, yan eh. Uh, so, Irarapol pa lang may notice na to the other party. And once ha, it is, ano, it is uh, raffled uh, to one court, ha, the trial on the, uh, the hearing on the application for a TRO would have to be terminated in 24 hours. Ha? Kasi nga, urgent. Ha? There is urgency in the matter. Now, however, so kailangan niya may hearing. Uh, urgent, uh, TRO, regular TRO. However, if the matter is of extreme urgency, uh, if the matter is of extreme urgency, no need for hearing in the meantime. Uh, you can apply for an ex parte uh, TRO before the executive judge. Uh, if the matter is of extreme urgency, Basta basically, pag TRO urgent, yung matter. Ha? May stop mo na. But if it is the matter of extreme urgency, na meron ka naman talagang basis, ha? tomorrow, ha? tanggalin na yung bahay na may pati bubog. Ha? Wala na, nag-uulan. Okay, ha? You, you, you need not, no? File in, uh, uh, an application for TRO uh, which would still, ano, uh, need to be heard, huh? you go to the EJ, huh? to the executive judge, and you apply for a 72-hour TRO. Tingnan nyo, huh? if the EJ issues a 72-hour uh, TRO, that is ex parte. Huh? Ex parte. So talagang the EJ would have to read huh? the application for a TRO. Kasi he can only issue ex parte to it. Uh, you can only issue the ex parte TRO, 72 RTRO, uh, in cases of extreme urgency. Pag hindi, di dinay ka agad dyan, and then ruffle it off. Now, on the other hand, uh, if the EJ decides to issue uh, an, uh, a TRO, 
and that is uh, has a lifetime only of 72 hours, uh, three days uh, from date of uh, uh, three days from date of issuance, uh, three days from date of from date of issuance. Now, within the three day period, kailangan yun, uh, yun ang lifetime, no? Kailangan yun marapol off already to the regular court. Uh, what is the purpose of raffling it off to the regular court. The regular court now will conduct a hearing uh, to find out if the 72 hours or 3 day lifetime of that TRO will be extended to its full extent of 20 days. Uh, pero ang rula, ang rula, a TRO is non-extendable. Uh, you are talking about the lifetime of a TRO, which is 20 days. Hindi pwedeng ma-extend yan to any other day. 20 days. Yung sinasabi mong extension is if the executive judge issues a 72-hour TRO in case of extreme urgency. Huh? Extreme urgency. So, 3 days lang yun. Huh? And that will be now the three days will now form part of the 20 days. Kaya irarapol yan to a regular court. And the regular court now will conduct a hearing to determine whether or not to extend. Ang ini-extend is to its full lifetime of 20 days. Follow nyo? But the pagkain 20 day period sa regular TRO, it is non-extendable. Huh? You don't need any judicial declaration. Huh? Because it is automatically terminated, it is automatically lifted on the 20th day. Expired na yan talaga. Huh? Now, uh, there is one scenario uh, where the judge uh, could not resolve as yet. Uh, di ba kailangan resolve yung preliminary injunction? During the lifetime. Nakakuwalang TRO, it has to be resolved. The application for preliminary injunction would have to be resolved within the lifetime of the TRO, which is 20 days. Huh? Okay, which is 20 days. The judge says he cannot uh, finish uh, with the hearing on the preliminary injunction. He cannot resolve the application for preliminary injunction within a period of 20, uh, within a period of 20 days, which is the lifetime of the TRO. And therefore, huh? within 20 day period, in extend niya yung TRO. Huh? Sabi niya, I am extending it, but my extension is pursuant to the rules. Huh? Because under the rules, in your CIPRO, under the rules, if you are filing an extension of time, huh? if you are making an extension of time, you have to do it within the original period. And the judge said, I am extending this, but it has not as yet expired, I am now extending this. So I am doing it within the original period, original lifetime. Huh? Okay, so in extend niya to for another 20 days ang lifetime ng TRO. And he did it within the 20 day lifetime. So sabi niya, pasok ako dun sa rule. If you're trying to make an extension, you do it, you do the extension within the original period. Okay. Natapos ngayon yung 20 day period. The person now, who was restrained, knowing that the TRO was already expired, kasi 20 days lang eh. Ha? Okay. The TRO was already expired. He, again, he continued again to do the act that was restrained. Nagalit ang judge, citing him for contempt. Correct? No. Yes. No. Sabi ng so. judge, ano ko? 20 days. That is contemptuous. <laughs> I have already extended <laughs> the lifetime of a TRO. And I did it. Seasonably. Because I did it during the lifetime of the origin the original lifetime of the TRO. Huh? I already extended. So that I'm citing you for contempt. Is the judge correct? Wrong. Very clear some rules say. No ba? Yan ang gross ignorance. Hmm? Yan super super. Kasi not extendable. You do not even need the judicial declaration. Nakalagi sa rules eh. Huh? So even if you did the extension within the original lifetime, huh? the fact is, automatic, like, ano? So you cannot cite him 
importante. Ikaw ang dapat masay for content. <laughs> Because you do not know what you're doing. Para niya? Okay. Um, one more thing. So, for purposes of a preliminary injunction, you have to, likewise, uh, affidavit plus bond, no? Uh, affidavit plus bond, injunction bond, uh, uh, na, as I said, yung PRO is uh, the same as uh, preliminary injunction. Kaya lang, pag PRO, uh, urgent. Now, for purposes of issuance of a written preliminary injunction, you need to post a an injunction bond. Question, do you likewise need to post a TRO bond. Hmm? This time, do you likewise need to post a TRO bond? Under the present rules, huh? sabi nga niya ni Justice Aquino, and he's sustained by the present rules, the TRO now has been elevated to the same status as a writ of preliminary injunction. And therefore, you likewise have to post a TRO bond. Ha? Unless you are, palagay naman doon eh, unless you are exempt, ha? exempted by the court. Ha? So if there is no exemption, ha? as if you are not allowed any exemption, you are to post a TRO bond. Because under the present rules, a TRO has already been elevated to the same status as a preliminary injunction. Okay. Ito pa. As a rule, sabi nito, as a general rule, courts should not issue a writ of preliminary injunction. Huh? General rule, courts should not issue a writ of preliminary injunction as it, as it would practically resolve the issues in the main case without trial. Huh? For example, uh, Uh, the issue is the unconstitutionality of a particular law uh, that is sought to be implemented uh, by a government agency. The issue is the unconstitutionality of a particular law that is sought to be implemented by a particular agency. Sabi ng Supreme Court, if you issue uh, a TRO or a writ of injunction to enjoin, to stop the implementation of that particular law, that would be a virtual declaration that there is doubt on the constitutionality of that law. So courts should be cautioned uh, and should be careful in issuing uh, a writ of preliminary injunction if it would have the effect of resolving the issue in the main case. Kasi ang issue precisely as unconstitutionality. So you do you seek to stop, huh? You seek to stop the implementation of a law which you claim to be unconstitutional. Ngayon pag nag-issue ang court ng injunction or TRO to stop the implementation, that is virtual resolution of the fact that may doubt talaga sa constitutionality of that law. Because the rule is, hindi ba, always in favor of the constitu constitutionality or validity of a law. Huh? So courts, sabi ngayon, should be careful huh? and should refrain from issuing preliminary injunction where the, uh, it would uh, uh, resolve the issue in the main case. Now, when are you, when can the courts not issue huh? a TRO or an injunction? Important yan, ano? So, you can, the courts cannot issue a preliminary injunction or cannot enjoin, cannot issue preliminary injunction or TRO to restrain, number one, government financial institutions. Uh, government financial institutions, intra-corporate disputes, labor cases, uh, infrastructure,
short projects, agrarian reform, licenses, and the issuance of licenses, you cannot restrain, ordinances, orders, not of ordinances, orders, resolutions of the PCGG, the Public Service Commission, uh, that cannot be restrained. And generally, uh, the courts cannot restrain criminal prosecution. Please, uh, important yan that you remember. Uh, the courts cannot issue TRO or injunction to restrain government financial institutions, intra-corporate disputes, um, labor cases or labor-related cases, infrastructure projects of the government, agrarian reform, licenses, orders, resolutions of the PCGG, the Public Service Commission, and generally criminal prosecution. Okay, alam na lifetime TRO, 20 days, 60 days if issued by CA, and if issued by the Supreme Court until further orders. Okay, now, Executive Judge TRO. Now, when is a final injunction granted? So, na issue yan, preliminary injunction. So, the act is, in the meantime, uh, restrained. Okay, so when is a final injunction issued or granted? A final injunction is granted after trial. Siyempre rin naman. Na-restrain yan during the pendency of the trial by virtue of the preliminary injunction. Now, a final injunction is granted after trial where it appears that uh, the applicant is entitled to have the act permanently enjoined. So final injunction is after trial. It is in fact included in the judgment. Huh? That uh, the applicant is entitled to have the act permanently enjoined. Now, you know, uh, rate of injunction, uh, the injunction can be dissolved. No? The injunction can be dissolved by posting a counter bond or by an application for dissolution. Now, please take note that if the main case is dismissed, the writ of preliminary injunction is automatically dissolved uh, because it is simply a provisional remedy. Uh, if the main case is dismissed, the writ of injunction is automatically dissolved. If that main case is refiled or revived, the writ of preliminary injunction is not actually revived. You have to reapply. Uletang. If the main case is dismissed, the writ of preliminary injunction is automatically dissolved. That is issued in that case. If that case is revived, the writ of injunction is not automatically revived. You have to reapply. Huh? You have to refile or reapply for a writ of preliminary injunction. Now, what is the remedy against an order denying an application for a TRO? Now, what is the remedy against an order denying an application for a TRO? Huh? Being uh, an appeal definitely is out from an order because it is interlocutory. Huh? It cannot even be questioned by certiorari. So what is your remedy? If your application for a TRO is denied, you go to trial. Mm -hmm. huh? You go to trial and if it is an adverse judgment, appeal from the judgment. It is only when there are some circumstances showing inadequacy of appeal huh, may certiorari be resorted to. But yung appeal, huh, hindi, uh, you cannot appeal no, from the unfavorable ruling. You appeal only from the unfavorable judgment. So if your uh, application for TRO or injunction is denied, the best thing is to go to trial. Huh? If it, the, the, the judgment is adverse, then you uh, 
uh, appeal from the judgment. Okay, can we take a break? So, hindi ka na pwede mag-file ng extension of time. If you want to file a petition for certiorari and the Rule 65, you have to do it talaga within a period of 60 days. Huh? From service of the resolution. From notice of the resolution. Ito. The public respondent shall proceed with the principal case. Huh? The public respondent shall proceed with the principal case within 10 days from the filing of the petition for certiorari with the higher court absent a TRO or a preliminary injunction. 
As I said, no, the mere filing of a petition, na, the mere filing of the petition will not stop the proceedings in the lower court. Kanyang ang MPC, sinertiorari mo yung order of the MPC to the RTC. The mere fact that you filed your petition for sertiorari with the RTC, hindi may stop na yun unless you are able to obtain a TRO or an injunction to stop the proceedings before the MPC. But, ang mali nila dito, I call their attention to this. Na, sabi dito, the public respondent, yung judge whose order is elevated via certiorari to the higher court. The public respondent shall proceed with the principal case within 10 days from the filing of the petition. Di ba mali ito? Ayag niyo, sige nang inabi ko. Five days from the, ah, Ten days from the filing of the petition. How would we know if you're the public respondent? Nasa trial court ka. Unfair naman yan. Ha? I was the reactor then eh. In a round table discussion. But we were using rectangular. No? I was the director. I was the representative of the RTCs. Hmm? I was questioning this. Unfair naman ito sa amin. Kasi if we do not go subject to administrative charge. If we did not proceed within ten days. Ha? And dapat to, from notice to the trial court, to the public respondent, that such a petition has already been filed. Ha? And to sabi ko, the filing, ako lalo na particularly, I told the justices, I was arguing, ah, lalo na ako particularly, if I find a petition for certiorari, questioning my order, I really don't care. What I, my point is, I did my job. Bahala na kayo. If you set it aside for all I care. Ha? But I did my job. So I, I'm not conscious of the filing. Tsaka late, pinibigay sa akin ang copy eh. Oh, yun pala, ma-admin na kami. Sabi nila, don't worry, we will change this again. Hindi pa nila chine-change. Okay. Ito pa, no? Sa rule, ah, sa dali, ah, in rule 45, this is what I'm trying to say. Sa rule 45, it's petition for review on certiorari. Ha? Okay. Under rule 45, in-amend yan. Sabi nga niya, in section 1 of rule 45, now allows, ha, the petition for certiorari. Petition for review on certiorari, Rule 45. Supreme Court lang yan, ha? Supreme Court lang yan, di ba? Petition for review on certiorari. It already includes an application for a writ of preliminary injunction, ha? Or other provisional remedies. Application. Doon sa petition for review on certiorari. Again, I raise this. Kasi yung a petition for application for a writ of preliminary injunction, ha? Must be heard. Hindi ba? A writ of preliminary injunction can never be issued ex parte. So there ought to be notice and hearing. Eh hindi ba ho sabi ninyo, you are not triers of max. Oo nga sila mag- Gets nyo? Kaya ang tagal bago ako na-promote eh. Hindi kasi, you are not triers of max and there is a need. Ha? There is a need for notice and hearing if you're applying for a writ of preliminary injunction. O sabi niyo naman ng mga justices, discard na namin yan. Huwag mo lang pakialaman yan. Okay? Yan. 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 Tuesday, next week. Tuesday. Oh, yeah, three days now. So, as far as receivership is concerned, you go to the purpose as a provisional remedy. We said that you can avail of it uh, even after judgment because the purpose is to preserve the property in litigation and to protect the interest of the parties in the litigation. Now, um, there must be, for purposes of appointment of a receiver, there must be a verified, yan nakalagay din sa rule, verified application for the appointment of a receiver. Now, there are actually two bonds that are being posted for purposes of receivership. The first bond is the bond for the appointment. So that bond is posted by the uh, by the applicant for the appointment of a receiver. Huh? Okay, bond is to be posted for the appointment of the uh, uh, 
by the appointment of a receiver. The next bond is to be posted by the receiver himself. Uh, that is the receiver's bond. So, dalawa talaga ang bond for purposes of receiver. The bond for the appointment of a receiver and the receiver's bond that is filed by the receiver himself. Now, can there be recovery? Of course, uh, that is a uh, condition also to answer for damages. The bond is conditioned to answer for damages. Now, how can you claim against the bond? If the, if the damages are sustained by reason of the appointment of the receiver, uh, if the damages are sustained by reason of the appointment of the receiver, you may recover damages against the bond in the same action by motion in the same action. However, if the damages are sustained by reason of the malfeasance or misfeasance of the receiver who has been appointed, then you can recover against the receiver's bond in a separate action, not in the same action where the receiver was appointed. Ulit ha? kasi dala dalawang bonds niyan eh. Okay, so if the, if the damages were sustained by reason of the appointment of the receiver, you can claim damages against that particular bond in the same action, ha? posted by the applicant, in the same action by motion. However, if the damages are sustained by reason of the malfeasance or misfeasance of the appointed receiver, you can claim damages against that receiver's bond but in a separate action, not in the same action where the receiver was appointed. Okay, Rule 60 is replevin. Please remember, number one, the replevin is to recover personal property. Replevin could either be a main action or a provisional remedy. Now, we're talking about replevin as a provisional remedy. This is to recover possession, or to recover personal property, okay? For purposes of obtaining a writ of replevin, uh, when do you file an application for writ of replevin? At any time before the filing of the answer. Uh, any time before the filing of the answer. Now. You have to execute an affidavit plus post a replevin bond. Huh? File an affidavit, post a replevin bond. Please take note that in the affidavit, it must contain uh, the fact that uh, uh, the property that you seek to recover possession of uh, is being unjustly detained by the defendant. It has not been taken for any tax execution or any tax assessment. And you have to state in your affidavit the market, actual market value of the property. Why? Because angry plebin bond that is to be posted should be double the value. Huh? Double the value as stated. Double the value of the property to be recovered as stated in the affidavit. Now, one thing important is the affidavit must state that the property that is sought to be recovered is being unjustly detained by the defendant or whoever it is you claim to be in possession of that property. Now, kailangan, sabi niya niya, in the case of, uh, uh, there's a case of Fulgencio Factor on case when he was still being an NR secretary, as uh, yung case on sabi ng Supreme Court, uh, you have to establish the fact that it is actually being unjustly detained. Huh? You have to establish the fact that it is being unjustly detained. And therefore, huh, what we do in the trial court is, huh, you before we issue the writ of replevin, again, we can conduct hearing. Because the burden huh, is still on the applicant to prove that that property, to prove the allegations in his affidavit, one of which is very important. Kasi ang local detention yan eh. So you seek to recover that is being unjustly detained. So you have to prove that it is unjustly detained. And how do we do it? During an ex parte hearing on the application. You know, uh, most often than not, the lawyers, uh, since they know that it can likewise be issued ex parte, yung writ of replevin, uh, but at the time they file their complaint, together with the application for the writ of replevin, nakakabit na yung bond. Because it is stated in the rules that the value of the bond is double the value of the property, the market value of the property. So, you know, amount of the bond, nakakapit na rin ang bond, huh? which is very presumptuous on their part. Because huh, in, in Supreme Court rulings, the applicant, huh, it, it does not follow, eh. it, it, it does not, the issuance is not a matter of course in the part of the court. Huh? 
Ha? May lang nga you still have to prove that that property that you seek to recover by virtue of the rate of repayment is being unjustly detained. So the fact of unjust detention is not merely para attachment yan. It is not merely alleged. You still have to prove it. Ha? Because automatically, pag sinerve yung rate of repayment, kuha na ka agad eh. Ha? Kuha na ka agad. Okay, unless, uh, uh, no, once it's taken, once it's taken, please take note, huh? if you want the property back because it was taken from you by, by virtue of a writ of replevin, what do you have to do? You do not post a, uh, a bond to discharge the writ of replevin, by the way. Huh? Kasi yung, yung, you post a counter bond, di ba, to discharge an attachment, you post a counter bond to dissolve Uh, to dissolve um, a writ of preliminary injunction, but you do not post a bond, uh, a counter bond, to discharge or dissolve a writ of replevin. What you post, ikaw ang person from whom the property is taken by virtue of a writ of replevin, ang pinopost mo is not a counter bond to discharge because you do not discharge a writ of replevin. What you post is a re-delivery bond. Because you simply want to get back the property that was taken from you by virtue of the rape of repayment. Yeah? So, attachment, counter bond to discharge. Injunction, counter bond to dissolve. But repayment, you do not uh, post a counter bond to discharge or rate of repayment. You post a re-delivery bond. Re-delivery bond to be posted within five days from the date of the taking. Okay? Now, Please take note, we said that replevin may either be a main action or a provisional remedy or both. Now, if it is a main action with application for a writ of replevin, na issue na yung writ of replevin, na na yung property. First, the judgment uh, would first have to say who is entitled to the possession of the property. Huh? Who is entitled to the possession of the property, the plaintiff or the defendant? If the court says that it is the plaintiff is entitled, uh, if the property has not as yet been delivered back to the plaintiff, then the court will direct in the same judgment uh, to the defendant to deliver, sa judgment na ba, to deliver the property to the plaintiff. Now, if no delivery can already be had, there cannot be any more any delivery, either because the property has been lost or anything, uh, for any reason, the property can no longer be de delivered, then you have to pay the value of the property plus damages. Yan yung alternative when you say replevin, alternative judgment in replevin. Huh? First, muna, there must be a determination in the same judgment of who is entitled to the possession of that property. Pagkatapos nun, pag sinabi na yung who is entitled, and then you go alternative. Deliver the property to the one a judge entitled to the possession of the property, or uh, if delivery cannot be made, pay the value plus damages. Uh, that is the judgment in replevin action. As well as replevin uh, as, a, as a main action and uh, as, a rep, uh, as a provisional remedy. Okay. Now, we said that the provisional remedies shall be availed of, uh, available in civil cases, shall be available also in criminal cases, but only in so far as they are applicable. Uh, only in so far as they are applicable. Now, there is now uh, a provision, you know very well, under the rules on civil procedure, uh, for availability of support pendente lite in criminal cases. Diba? In criminal cases. Dito muna tayo sa civil cases. In an action for support, ha, you may avail of uh, uh, support pendente lite. Ha? Now, in an action for support, ha, you may avail of support pendente lite only if ha, the right to be supported is no longer an issue. That is very important. Only if the right to be supported is no longer an issue. Because if the right to be supported is still an issue, huh, support pendentilite cannot be availed of. But yeah, why will you be why will you be directed huh, to 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 uh, to give support pendentilite when you deny any relationship with that person? That person is not entitled. Why support you? I don't even know you from Adam or Eve. <laughs> huh? Okay, so 
support pendentalit and therefore can be granted only if support is no longer an issue. Now, if the support is no longer an issue, then you apply, we said, file an application in the same action for support. Uh, there, uh, the, the respondent, the adverse party, will be made to comment uh, within a period of five days. There will be hearing three days after the filing of the comment. Three days to fi uh, five days to file comment, hearing three days, within a period of three days from the filing of the comment. Now, if the court grants the application for support pendent delete, it will direct the respondent to pay support pendent delete. Ang pinag-uusapan lang dyan is the capacity of the defendant to give support pendent delete. Now, the order granting support pendent delete if it is not complied with, the court may issue an order of execution. Huh? If the order uh, to for the defendant to give support pendentalite is not complied with, then the court may issue an order of execution of the order granting support pendentalite. Huh? Well, of course, without prejudice to a further uh, action for contempt. Now, what I'm driving at is the fact that an order granting support pendentalite huh, is interlocutory. Correct? Huh? Pendentalite kasi. So it is issued huh, during the pendency of the action. And therefore, it is not a final order. And therefore, it is interlocutory. Okay? The rule is you cannot execute huh, an order which is simply interlocutory. The rule is you can only execute, you can only implement a final order. Diba? A final order or judgment. Huh? If it is final, it is executory. That is the rule. But as far as support pendentalit is concerned, once it is not complied with, with the rule says, under Rule 61, uh, the court may issue an order of execution, which means that the order granting support pendentalite, uh, even if it is interlocutory, it can be executed, and therefore, it is an exception to the general rule that you can only enforce, implement, or execute a final order or judgment. Uh, that is an exception. Uh, kasi, interlocutory and yet huh, it is, it may be the subject of an order of execution. The rule is you cannot execute or implement an order uh, which has not as yet attained finality. In that instance, therefore, the order granting support pendentalita in is, is an exception to the rule. Next, now we say that support pendentalite is available now in criminal cases where support is, uh, where, uh, where, where liability includes support for the offspring, where liability includes support for the offspring of the crime. So, tatandaan niyo, you can only avail of support pendentalite. Sabi nga yan, where so liability includes support for the offspring of the crime. And therefore, you can apply for, rip, uh, for support pendentalite only if the crime is productive of a baby. Mm -hmm. huh? Kasi support for the offspring of the crime. E ano ba yung offspring? Hindi ba prada? Huh? of the crime. So, so only if the crime is support as uh, is productive of a baby because it's support for the offspring of the crime. Huh? So, titignan ninyo yung crime. Can you apply for support pendentalite in a prosecution for rape? Huwag ka agad na yes, ikaw-qualify nyo. The rape that is traditional and the rape that is object rape. Diba? Huh? If it is the traditional rape where there is SI, SI is not sin serious injury, you know what I mean. Uh, so, if it is the rape, the, the original rape, the traditional rape, where there is SI, you may apply if there is an offspring, di ba? Productive of a baby. But if it is sexual assault, it's a form of rape that cannot produce a baby, even if there is insertion. Huh? Okay, so it will qualify you. Can you apply for support for the delete in a prosecution for abduction? No, ah. 
Sinabi ko na yun sa inyo in your undergrad. No, you cannot apply for support pendentalite in a prosecution for abduction, consented or forcible. Why? Wala naman yan, SI. You simply take away a woman. You might told you even with lewd, if you're taking away with lewd designs, even if no matter how bastos your mind is, when you take away the woman, it cannot produce a baby. So you cannot apply for support pendentalite. Is it productive of a baby? Iba pag forcible abduction with rape. Diba? How about prosecution for seduction? Huh? Simple, qualified. Yes. Why? Because seduction, may SI yan. Huh? SI if it is uh, uh, qualified, if the offender is able to have SI with the victim or with the offended party huh? by taking advantage of moral ascendancy, relationship, etc. Huh? Okay. Tapos if uh, uh, simple seduction, if the offender is, uh, is able to have SI with the victim or the offended party through deceit, cajolery, huh? deceit. Huh? So you have to be very careful with respect to support pendente lete. Huh? If in criminal cases it is support for uh, if the liability includes support for the offspring of the crime. So, tipig na ninyo yung nature of the crime. Okay. Special civil actions, please, how are they different from ordinary civil actions? Huh? Because they cover, special civil actions, they cover specific uh, situations. Huh? They cover specific situations. For example, special civil action of expropriation. Huh? Nakatuon lang yan a situation where the government or the state exercises its power of eminent domain. So it covers special situations. Or pagka, uh, pagka sorcerary, prohibition, mandamus, specific situations. But, uh, uh, abuse of discretionary, uh, abuse of discretion. Huh? If there's abuse of discretion, prohibition, you want to stop the commission of performance of the act. Mandamus, you want to compel the performance of the act. Huh? So, scarce the special civil actions, they cover specific situations. Uh, 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 other than those ordinarily covered in ordinary civil actions. Next, special civil actions may provide for their own rule of procedure. Uh, they may provide for their own rule of procedure. If the special civil action, however, does not provide for its own rule of procedure, then the regular rules of procedure will be made to apply in a supplementary character. Huh? For as long as it's a special civil action, it may, because there are certain special civil actions that provide for their own rules of procedure. Pag wala silang rules of procedure, then the all the regular rules of procedure as applied to ordinary civil actions will be made to apply. Okay. Next point. There are special civil actions that are initiated by means of a complaint, and there are special civil actions that are initiated by means of a petition. What are those special civil actions that are initiated by means of a complaint? Partition, interpleader, foreclosure of mortgage, expropriation, forcible entry, unlawful detainer. Ulet, ha? P, Pex, Fu. Ha? Partition, interpleader, foreclosure of mortgage, EX expropriation, F forcible entry, U unlawful detainer. The rest of the special civil actions are initiated by means of a petition. Ah, di ba? Declaratory relief, certiorari prohibition mandamus, which is Rule 64 is petition for review of the decisions, resolutions, the public and the COA. Huh? What else? Uh, contempt that is initiated, co-warranto that's initiated by means of a petition. Huh? Now, if the special civil action is initiated by means of a complaint, remember the responsive pleading is an answer. If the special civil action is initiated by means of a petition, 
the responsive pleading is a comment. Huh? So if you want, to, we, we have, sometimes you have to be technical about it. If initiated by means of a complaint, the responsive pleading is an answer. If initiated by means of a petition, the responsive pleading is a comment. Okay. Let's start with interpreter, Rule 62. Basta tatandaan lang ninyo, madali lang madetect if it is interpreter. Pag interpreter, there are several claimants uh, to one property or interest that is held or in the possession of someone who has no interest over that property. Na? Okay, I am in possession of this property over, over which I have no interest. But there are several claimants to this property. Ha? So, ano dyan? Kanino, sino ba talaga kuya? Ha? Sino ba talaga entitled dito? So now I am forced to file ha? Uh, uh, an action for interpreter. Initiated by means of a complaint. Now, once a complaint for interpreter is filed, the first order that is issued by the court is an order to the defendants, the adverse claimants, uh, the conflicting claimants. It is an order for them to interplead with one another and file their respective answers to the complaint. Uh, okay, now, file their respective answers to the complaint. Now, within a period uh, service of summons because uh, it's by provision no? service of summons uh, the, the, the claimants, the adverse claimants may file a motion to dismiss uh, motion to dismiss on any, any applicable ground as provided for under rule 16 motion to dismiss on any applicable ground as provided for in rule 16 there can even be a ground of impropriety. Why? Why can there be a ground of impropriety? For example, isa lang naman ang claimant. Huh? So there is no. Si interpreter contemplates several. Yun lang tanda niya eh. Interpreter contemplates several claimants to one property. Huh? So lahat sila may interest sa property niya. Huh? Forced na yun yung tao, itong play person, uh, in possession of the property to file the action. And let them prove their respective claims. So it could be dismissed on the ground of impropriety. Now, if the motion to dismiss is denied, you have to file your answer within the balance. Parang ano, no? Within the balance of the period to file an answer, but in no case should it be less than five days. Now, what happens? Interpreter action. Uh, if the claimants to that property, subject of the interpreter action, if all these claimants now withdraw their claim, or if uh, the claimants withdraw, leaving only one who is claiming, sige, ikaw na lang. Huh? We do not want to stake a claim on that property anymore. Or if all the claimants already withdraw their claim, huh? and the action has already been pending, huh? they already withdraw their claim to that property. Now, what happens to the case? Diba, logically, the case would be considered uh, as terminated. It will be dismissed. Huh? Because it has already become moot and academic. Because there are no more claimants. Huh? And that is the very nature of interpreter. Several claimants to one and the same property. Hindi mo alam kung kanino ibibigay. So, the plaintiff is forced to file the action. But if all these claimants have already withdrawn their claim to that property, it will already render the action moot and academic. Correct? Huh? But according to the Supreme Court, yes, but not so fast in the dismissal. Huh? Because please take note. Uh, you have to still give, the court will still have to give the plaintiff an opportunity to prove the damages he has sustained. What damages is he talking about? Uh, the damages he sustained by re, by uh, in having been compelled to institute the action. Kailangan iset pa rin yan for hearing. It's not an automatic termination. It's not an automatic dismissal by the fact that it has been rendered moot and academic. You have to give the plaintiff an opportunity to prove any damages that he may have sustained by reason of the filing or the institution of the interpreter action. Remember, he was forced to institute. Huh? Nag-pay siya ng docket fees, nag-hire siya ng lawyer to prosecute that because he is confused to whom he will give that property. 
Huh? That is what should you remember as far as interpleader action is concerned. Now, Rule 63, declaratory relief. Ah, madali lang yan. Because what is the purpose of declaratory relief? Basically, you want an, a construction or interpretation. What is the basis? You know that the, the, the petitioner here, okay, it is initiated, declaratory relief is initiated by means of a petition. Hindi yan kasama sa PFEX po. Okay? So, declaratory relief is initiated by means of a petition. The petitioner here is aware that he has rights under a certain deed, instrument, ordinance, executive order, statute. Alam niya that he has rights, but he does not know what are those rights. Huh? He knows that he has rights under that instrument, but he does not know what are those rights. And therefore, he wants, he files a petition for declaratory relief huh? because he wants the court to interpret huh? and tell him what are his rights under those instruments. Yun ang purpose ng declaratory relief. Construction, interpretation of an instrument, an ordinance, an executive order, a statute. Hindi niya, declaratory, declare. Huh? You want a, the court to interpret the law and the written instrument and tell you what are your rights. That is why huh? kailangan the petition for declaratory relief would have to be filed before there is a breach or violation of that instrument. Huh? It has to be filed before there is a breach or violation of that instrument, law, statute, ordinance. Why? Because you know that you have rights. You want a declaration of your rights. So, before kailangan mag violate yan, you already file a, a, a petition for declaratory relief. Why? Because if na violate yung instrument na yan, huh? if that instrument, statute, ordinance, municipal ordinance, or statute, or law, executive order, is violated, eh, alam mo na may rights ka dyan. Di ba you simply want a declaration of what are your rights? Mm -hmm. huh? Now, if under this instrument, now if that instrument, huh, even before you even file a petition for declaratory relief, huh, that instrument is violated, that instrument is breached, therefore, there is already a violation of your right, which is there. You simply want a declaration eh. Huh? So, pagka na-violate yung law na yun, alam mo na may rights ka doon, only you do not know the rights. But you know that you have rights. Na violate your law na yon. Na violate your instrument na yon. So may violation na ng right mo. If there is a violation of your right, you now have a cause of action, correct? Huh? And you have a cause of action. You file an ordinary civil action. Mm. Huh? Gets nyo? So hindi na. Uh, hindi na. Saka, saka na lang ipoprove yan. Ano ba yung na violate? Ano ba yung cause of action? The point is, there is a right that has been violated. Therefore, you have a cause of action. You do not file anymore. Petition. Na preempt na. Huh? But if you want to file a petition for declarate, uh, declaratory relief, kailangan wala pang breach or violation. In fact, huh, if you already filed a petition for declaratory relief, during the pendency of that petition, wala pang action ng court, wala pang construction ng court with respect to that particular instrument, that particular law, statute, ordinance. Huh? nagkaroon na ng violation. Na? Hindi ba under section 6 or 5 of this particular rule, the action is already converted from declaratory relief na? to an ordinary civil action. Because of the violation, there has been a violation likewise of your rights. Yes, now? Okay. Na? So the only question sabi to be raised Huh? In declaratory relief is construction or uh, the construction arising from that particular instrument. The judgment in a declaratory relief action cannot extend beyond a declaration of the rights and duties of the parties huh, to the instrument. Huh? Okay. Next point. 
Since ang action for declaratory relief simply wants a declaration of your rights, ha? you cannot secure material relief in that action. Hmm? You cannot secure material relief. No material relief is sought in declaratory relief. So the de respondent there cannot file a third party complaint. Ha? He cannot file a third party complaint. Ha? Kasi hinihingan lang ng declaration. Yeah? So the respondent cannot file a third party complaint, ha? cannot be entertained. Ha? However, a compulsory counterclaim may be set up. The respondent cannot set up a third or file a third party complaint because no material relief is sought in a declaratory relief action, but he can set up a counterclaim. Ha? Uh, he can set up a counterclaim in that action. Now, Rule 64 is review. Rule 64 is review of the resolution judgments of the COMELEC and the POA. Now, what should you remember? Tignan Rule 64 adopts the procedure in Rule 65. Specific kasi, Yung Rule 64, review of the resolutions, huh? review of the resolutions, uh, resolutions, judgments of the COMELEC and the COA. Huh? But Rule 64 adopts the procedure in Rule 65. Huh? But despite the fact that it adopts the procedure in Rule 65, for purposes of certiorari, huh, meron mga differences. For example, you file your petition for certiorari uh, review, huh, review of judgments with the Supreme Court huh, via a petition for certiorari. Kasi nga, ina-adapt yung procedure under Rule 65. Huh? So for purposes of review of the resolution of the COMELEC and the COA, huh, kailangan you file your petition for certiorari before the Supreme Court. Huh? You review under Rule 64, even if it is a petition, in effect a petition for certiorari, huh, adopting the procedure of certiorari, it is to be filed within a period of 30 days from notice of the judgment or resolution of the COMELEC or the COA. Hindi ba ordinarily a petition for certiorari would have to be filed within a period of 60 days. Reckon from notice of, uh, reckon from notice of uh, uh, the order, uh, reckon from notice of the resolution or judgment of the COMELEC and the COA. Now, the Supreme Court will uh, issue an order for the respondent to file a comment within 10 days. Uh, within 10 days. Or the court may dismiss the case outright. Uh, if it's not sufficient in form and in substance. Now, what is the effect of the filing of a petition for certiorari uh, under Rule 64? If a petition for certiorari under Rule 64 uh, against the resolution or judgment of the Comer or the COA is filed, it will not stay the execution of the resolution or the judgment of the COA or the uh, COMELEC. Uh, it will not stay the judgment uh, uh, or order uh, unless the Supreme Court directs otherwise. Uh, unless the Supreme Court directs otherwise. Okay. Rule 65, certiorari prohibition mandamus. Certiorari prohibition mandamus, the common ground is grave abuse of discretion. Alam niyo, if you read a lot of decisions, it's not enough that there was abuse of discretion. Kailangan there must be a showing of grave abuse of discretion where the exercise of discretion by the court Ha, has been capricious, whimsical, arbitrary, walang ka basis basis. Ha, whimsical, capricious, arbitrary. A mere showing of abuse of discretion ha, is not enough for purposes of certiorari prohibition mandamus. Talagang grave. Ha, whimsical, 
capricious, arbitrary, oppressive, huh? without any basis whatsoever. Now, ang common denominator for resorting to certiorari, grave abuse of discretion, huh? uh, 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 certiorari prohibition mandapos is when there is no appeal nor any other plain, speedy, and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. Please, uh, very important yan. When there is no appeal, tandaan nyo, pag sinabi for purposes of certiorari prohibition mandamus, there is no appeal. Meaning that the order or resolution subject of the petition for certiorari prohibition or mandamus is essentially non-appealable. Hindi sinasabi when there is no more appeal. Ha? Kasi, sir, pag natin, when there is no more appeal, appeal was available, lumampas na lang yung period, now you make use of certiorari. No, because certiorari is not a substitute for a lost appeal. Ha? Ang sinasabing certiorari, where you can resort to certiorari private mandamus, is when there is no appeal. When you say when there is no appeal, the question resolution, the question order is basically non-appealable. And where do you find that? You find that in Rule 41. Tandaan ninyo, pakimemorize. Ha? For purposes of certiorari and prohibition mandamus, sabi nga yan, ha? ang remedy ha? from the orders which are not appealable ha? is the appropriate remedy under Rule 65. Uh, usually, it is certiorari. But Rule 65, <coughs> Rule 65 covers certiorari prohibition mandamus. Remember too that Rule 41 has already removed huh, the uh, no, uh, uh, non appealable order. Is uh, it is no longer yung order denying a motion for new trial or reconsideration. Tinanggal na sa Rule 41. Na? So, in, uh, so, if the order is, uh, if the order denies a motion for new trial or reconsideration, hindi, since hindi na siya kasama sa Rule 41, hindi ka magre-resort sa certiorari. Your only remedy, therefore, once your motion for new trial or reconsideration is denied, your only remedy is to to appeal from the judgment. Ha? Hindi mo na pwedeng uh, i-assail ang propriety of the order denying your motion for new trial or reconsideration via certiorari. Ha? So, pag certiorari prohibition mandamus, ha? The remedy, uh, there is no appeal. Basically, therefore, the order is not appealable. What are the non-appealable orders, resolutions, judgments? Please go to Rule 41. Paki memorize. Huh? Para hindi kayo mamislead as far as Rule 65 is concerned. Okay. Where do you file? Uh, when do you file? Huh? A petition for certiorari prohibition mandamus under Rule 65. You file it within a period of 60 days huh, from notice of the order, resolution, or the judgment. Hmm? Uh, where do you file it? You file it in the RTC. Huh? You file it in the uh, RTC, the CA, and uh, the Sandigan Bayan, kasama na ngayon, and uh, the Sandigan Bayan, whether or not in aid of their appellate jurisdiction. Huh? Now, for purposes of certiorari prohibition mandamus, tandaan niyo, since it is initiated by means of a petition, what is the responsive pleading? Comment. The comment is to be filed within a period of 10 days from receipt of the copy of the petition. Upon the receipt of the copy, upon the filing of the petition, huh? it shall no longer, the, the filing of the petition, for example, you want to question the order of the trial court. Huh? So, so, say, first level court. Now, file ka ng petition for certiorari before the RTC. Huh? Hindi na pwede i-invoke yung eternal guardian's case. Huh? Which provided for judicial courtesy. Wala na yan. Huh? 
Therefore, under the present rules, the mere filing of a petition for certiorari before the higher court to question an order or resolution of the lower court, the mere filing of the petition will not stop. Huh? It will not stop, uh, it will not uh, uh, affect or interrupt the course of the principal case. In other words, it was have been out of judicial courtesy, Your Honor, to the higher court, which has already taken cognizance of our petition for certiorari, we move for the suspension of the proceedings before this court. Hindi na pwede yan. Huh? The mere filing of a petition for certiorari with the higher court will not interrupt the course of the proceedings in the lower court unless you are able to secure a TRO or an injunction from the court where you filed the petition for certiorari. Now, wala na yung judicial courtesy. Okay, it will not be discourteous anyway because wala na sa rules. Okay, now, after the filing of the comment, we said the comment is to be filed within a period of 10 days from notice. Okay, now, after the filing of the comment, huh, the court may, uh, the court may uh, hear the case or require the presentation or the submission of the party's respective memorandum. If the court finds the allegations to be true after hearing or based on the memorandum, then the court will grant the relief prayed for and set aside the question, order, or resolution. But if the court does not find the allegations to be true, the court will dismiss the petition for certiorari. I'll get to the amendments later, no? The amendments. Okay, now. Under uh, Rule 66, which is a petition for co-warranto. Again, co-warranto is initiated by means of a petition. Huh? What is the uh, uh, nature of an action? Ito judicial uh, uh, co-warranto. Huh? Because there is co-warranto likewise under the Omnibus Election Code. Co-warranto, usurpation of public office, possession, or franchise. Usurpation of public office, possession, or franchise. The writ of co-warranto, judicial, writ of co-warranto is a prerogative writ by which the government calls on the individual to explain by what title uh, he is occupying that position. Olet, it is a prerogative writ, yung that which is issued by the court. The writ of co warranto is a prerogative writ by which the government calls on an individual to show by what title he is occupying the public position or the public office or exercising a public uh, franchise. Now, Upon the other hand, the co-warranto under the Omnibus Election Code, uh, the exclusive purpose of co-warranto is to impugn the election of the public officer on the ground of disloyalty or disqualification to hold office or ineligibility. Uh, the only purpose of co-warranto in the Election Code uh, is to impugn the election of the public officer on the ground of ineligibility, disloyalty to the Republic of the Philippines. Who files the petition uh, for co-warranto? It is the sole gen or the fiscal. Uh, it is the sole gen or the fiscal. Can the private individual who claims uh, entitled to the position but was usurped by the respondent, can he file likewise? Yes. Huh? He can likewise file a petition for co warrant huh? Sorry, An individual entitled to the public office usurped may bring an action uh, in his own name. Huh? For basically, huh, it is the soldier or the fiscal uh, who, who files uh, the petition for co warranto But the person uh, who, who, who claims to be entitled to the position that has been usurped may file a petition in his own name. Now, 
where do you file a petition for co-warranto before the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, or the Regional Trial Court? Petition for co-warranto. Supreme Court. Concurrent ito, ah, but you have to observe judicial hierarchy. Ah, concurrent jurisdiction. When do you file a petition for co-warranto within a period of one year after the cause of the ouster? <clears throat> After you file a petition for co-warranto, huh? uh, you file it within one year from the cause of the ouster. Now, if judgment is rendered in that petition for co-warranto, the petitioner may ask for damages. And he can file an action for damages by reason of the usurpation within a period of one year from entry of the judgment, uh, establishing his right to the office that was usurped. Okay, expropriation. As far as expropriation is concerned, please, di ba binago yan? Huh? in procedural law because eminent domain is a political law concept. It is actually a matter of substantive law. Eminent domain, that is the power of the state huh? to take private property huh? for public purpose upon payment of just compensation. Now, the exercise now, how will the state exercise its power of eminent domain through expropriation? Ito yung remedial. Huh? Ito yung remedy. Huh? This is the procedural aspect. Kaya ginawa nila expropriation. Rightly so. Huh? It was amended. Dati eminent domain yan eh. But eminent domain, as we said, is a substantive law concept, constitutional, uh, political law concept. Itong expropriation is a procedural law aspect. Huh? It is through expropriation that the state exercises its power of eminent domain. Okay, now, please remember that if the state would want to expropriate the property of a private individual, the mere manifestation of intent to expropriate has no bearing. It will not bind the land. It is the actual filing of the complaint for expropriation that will uh, that will bind the land that is supposed to be expropriated. I made mention of complaint huh? because expropriation is initiated by means of a complaint. Now, if expropriation is initiated by means of a complaint, please take note, kailangan yan, ito special civil action that provides for its own procedure. In expropriation, once a complaint for expropriation is filed, the defendant cannot uh, the, yes the defendant cannot file a motion to dismiss a motion please a motion to dismiss is not allowed in expropriation proceedings huh? because what is to be filed by the owner of the property that is sought to be expropriated number 1 if he has no objection to the expropriation of his property, what he files is a manifestation of no objection. In lang, huh? If he has no objection to the expropriation of his property, he simply files a manifestation of no objection. If he has an objection to the expropriation of his property, he files an answer. Dun sa answer, ipiplead niya yung objections. Huh? But a motion to dismiss, he cannot file a motion to dismiss. Pag wala siyang objection, file a manifestation of no objection. If, if he has an objection, file an answer and plead in the answer the objections. Motion to dismiss, not allowed. If the objection is overruled, huh? if the objection to the expropriation is overruled, or no party appears, huh, then the court will issue an order of expropriation. Once the
the court issues an order of expropriation, it will now foreclose any other objection to the expropriation of the property. Bibigyan pa rin ang chance eh. Hmm? But if he does not interpose an objection or nobody appears, the court now uh, may issue an order of expropriation. Once the court issues an order of expropriation, it forecloses any other uh, any other objection to the expropriation. Ang next step na yan is determination of just compensation. By the way, once you file under Rule 67, once you file, once the state files, uh, or agency, instrumentality, files a complaint for expropriation, uh, the, 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 the plaintiff, agency, or government, uh, can enter into the possession of the property. Uh, but before entry, uh, the plaintiff would have to make a deposit. Uh, with the appropriate depository agency uh, in an amount equivalent to the assessed value of the property. That is under Rule 67, Ordinary Expropriation. But there is the, there is the law, Republic Act 8974. Uh, this would involve expropriation of property for national government infrastructure projects. Yeah? 8974, expropriation of property for national government infrastructure projects. Now, dito nagkakaiba sila with respect to the uh, amount to be given or deposited for purposes of entering into the property, taking possession of the property. Under Rule 67, which is ordinary expropriation, uh, it deposit lang sa government depository an amount equivalent to the assessed value of the property. However, under 8974, expropriation of uh, property for national government infrastructure projects, uh, the law requires for purposes of taking possession that you pay, the plaintiff pays the owner of the property the amount which is equivalent to 100% uh, of the value of the property. Uh, plus the property and the improvements. Uh, 100% pay to the owner of the property one an amount equivalent to 100% of the value of the property and the improvements thereon based on the value, based on the current relevant zonal valuation of the BIA. Huh? Kasi remember the case of ano, yung, yung judge yung, Judge, yeah, RTC Pasay, the one who was killed in Sapiatko. Huh? The Supreme Court reversed the order of judge of the judge. Gin Goyan? Basta G. Ano? Uh, because the Supreme Court said it was a wrong law that he applied. He applied Rule 67 and issued an order to the government uh, expropriating yung piyat ko ba, yung Terminal 3? Ang basa na yan. <laughs> yung piyat ko yung Terminal 3? Sabi nga, sabi ng Supreme Court doon, this is an instance which is unique because the government is expropriating an improvement that is erected on the property belonging to the government. Huh? Unique nga daw yan eh. Inexpropriate yung property that is found or erected on the property actually already belong to the government. Di ba ang piyat ko nagtayo nun? Huh? Now we're trying to expropriate it. Huh? So it's a national government infrastructure. Sabi nga, you do not apply Rule 67. Kasi pinabayad lang niya is the amount equivalent to the assessed value. Applying Rule 67. But this is no ordinary expropriation. Huh? This is expropriation under 8974 and therefore you are to pay according to the Supreme Court. Ano na to? Huh? Millions of dollars ang pinapapay. So the value, 100% of the value of the property plus the improvements, huh? 
based on the current relevant zonal valuation of the BIR. Yeah? So, magkaiba under Rule 67 and under 8974. Yeah. Now, also, in, a, in an action for expropriation, what happens if the defendant fails to file an answer. Alam naman natin, in ordinary civil actions, if the defendant fails to file an answer, he can be declared in default. Correct? Huh? He can be declared in default on motion of the plaintiff. But in expropriation, under Rule 67, there can be no declaration of default. Huh? Even if the defendant, owner of the property that is sought to be expropriated, will not or will fail to file an answer in the expropriation case, uh, he cannot be declared in default. Why? Because he can still participate uh, in the proceedings for the determination of just compensation. Because uh, if you are declared in default, you lose your standing in court. You cannot participate in the proceedings. Dito, he is not defaulted even if he does not file an answer because he can still participate in the proceedings before the commissioners uh, in the determination for the determination of the amount of just compensation. Okay, foreclosure mortgage, this is judicial foreclosure. If it is extrajudicial foreclosure, it is Act 3135 as amended by Act 4118. No? Extrajudicial. Please take uh, remember, you took this up in your LTD. If it is um, Based on the REM contract, no? real estate mortgage contract. Hmm? If there is not payment of the obligation, you may resort to foreclosure. But for you to resort to extrajudicial foreclosure of mortgage, ha? kailangan in the REM contract, nakalagay yung provision na yun. That in case of non-payment of the mortgage debt, they resort to extrajudicial foreclosure under Act 3135 as amended. Yeah? If there is no such provision or such clause in the REM contract, real estate mortgage contract, and there is no satisfaction of the obligation, you can only go judicial. Yeah? That is why there is, a, there is a provision for judicial foreclosure mortgage if there is no provision in the REM contract that you will resort to extrajudicial foreclosure. Now, for purposes of judicial foreclosure mortgage, uh, you file a what? A complaint. Uh, since it is initiated by means of a complaint, the defendant mortgagor files an answer. Uh, Defendant mortgage files an answer. Silence siya, so pwede magkaroon ng pre-trial, pwede magka uh, after the pre-trial, magkakaroon ng hearing. Ha? It is a if it's an ordinary civil action, it's foreclosure, no? It covers a specific situation. Now, uh, if the judgment is in favor uh, of the plaintiff mortgagee, the court will direct the defendant mortgagor to pay the mortgage debt. Uh, plus, plus, plus yan. Uh, kasi meron ng file na action. Okay, now, in judicial foreclosure, very important, there is no right of redemption on the part of the mortgage debtor. There is only equity of redemption. What is equity of redemption? It is the right of the mortgagor to extinguish the mortgage uh, and retain ownership of the property by paying uh, the mortgage debt within a period of 90 to 120 days from entry of judgment or even, be, uh, even before the foreclosure sale. Pwede pa rin yang bayaran, retain ownership, but before, uh, but before the confirmation of the sale. Uh, equity of redemption is the right of the mortgagor uh, to extinguish the mortgage 
and retain ownership of the property by paying the debt within 90 to 120 days from entry of judgment or even before the uh, even before the foreclosure sale but before its confirmation the confirmation of the foreclosure sale as distinguished from right of redemption remember a uh, judicial equity of redemption but extrajudicial jan lang available ang right of redemption the right of redemption is the right to of the mortgagor ito to repurchase redeem it. Huh? the right of redemption is the right of the mortgagor to repurchase the property even after the confirmation of the sale huh? in cases of foreclosure of sale Huh? Even in case of foreclosure of sale by the banks, huh? but it is uh, he is to redeem to repurchase within a period of one year, huh? twelve months. Reckon from when? From date of registration of the certificate of sale. Repurchase redemption. Yung isa pay extinguish the debt, mortgage debt by paying the obligation. The order of confirmation of the foreclosure sale shall be registered uh, in the registry of deeds for purposes of issuance of the title now in favor of the mortgage. Okay, partition. Again, this is judicial. Uh, if it is if the parties agree to terminate the co-ownership, they may do so extrajudicially. Huh? Itong partition is judicial. It is to compel termination. That is why what is first to be determined huh, in an action for partition, by the way, it's initiated by what? Complaint. Huh? It is initiated by means of complaint. So, if a complaint for partition is filed, the first thing to be determined is if there is a co-ownership. Because you know purpose it. Eh? Huh? There's nothing to partition and there's no co-ownership over a property. Huh? So the first stage is determine whether or not huh, co-ownership exists. Huh? If the co-ownership is determined, huh? then you go partition. File partition, uh, and partition is proper. Uh, now, uh, it, uh, you commence the action uh, if there is a uh, determining co-ownership, if there is co-ownership, uh, and they do not want to partition, file. The heir who is interested, or the, the co-owner who is interested in terminating the co-ownership will now file an action for partition in court. This is judicial partition to compel the partition, to compel the termination of the co-ownership and compel partition. Okay. The action for partition, please take note, does not prescribe. Huh? It does not prescribe except when the co-ownership is properly repudiated by the co-owner. What do we mean by this? Huh? The action for partition does not prescribe except when the co-ownership is properly repudiated by the co-owner. In other words, the co-owner cannot acquire by prescription the share of his co-owner. He cannot acquire by prescription the share of the other co-owners absent a clear repudiation of co-ownership. Uh, he cannot acquire by prescription the share of the co-owner uh, absent a clear uh, repudiation of the co-ownership that has been duly communicated to the other co-owners. What would consist of the order of partition? The order of partition is determinative of the issue of the existence of the co-ownership and the right to terminate the same. Kasi pag 
pasok mo, may order na kagad ng ownership. I-determine dyan the existence of the ownership that needs to be partitioned. That is why you're trying to compel partition because you believe that there exists a co-ownership. Now, that order of partition, please take note, is a final order. And therefore, it is appealable. Hmm? The order of, co of, part, uh, of partition is determinative of the issue of the existence of co-ownership and the right to terminate it. That order is final and therefore appealable even if the matter of actual partition or accounting will still have to be resolved. Huh? What is final is the order of partition. Even the matter of accounting, matter of actual partition is still to be resolved. Okay, very important. Mas lumalabas kasi ito sa bar. Forcible entry, unlawful detainer. Ito lumalabas ko sa bar. Yung mga iba kasi hindi eh. Pero basahin nyo na, prepare kayo dito. Yung mga ano, uh, important points. Okay, forcible entry, unlawful detainer actions, please. These are actions to recover real property. Replevin, action to recover personal property. Action to recover, to recover real property, you have three actions, di ba? Action interdictal, forcible entry and lawful detainer. Interdictal, forcible entry and lawful detainer. If you would want to recover physical possession of the property, no recovery of title is involved. You want to recover physical possession of the property, action interdictal. Huh? Forcible entry or unlawful detainer. That is under Rule 70. You want to recover, likewise, possession of real property, but you filed it beyond one year. Huh? From date when the action is supposed to be filed, that is action publician. If you want to recover both, possession, and title to real property, it is reinvindicatory. Okay, now, remember, this in your seat from, the courts of the first level, the MTCs, the METCs, have original exclusive jurisdiction over action interdicta, forcible entry, and lawful detainer. RTC of exclusive jurisdiction, uh, original jurisdiction over Publishana and Reinvindicatoria. Although, huh, as far as Reinvindicatoria is concerned, alam nyo na, under 7691, even the MTCs now can have jurisdiction over Reinvindicatoria. Action to recover title and possession of real property. Under what circumstances? Depending on the assessed value of the real property. If the assessed value of the real property uh, situated in the province does not exceed 20,000, or if the assessed value of the real property does not exceed 50,000 in the metropolitan area, Action Reinvindicatoria will be under the jurisdiction of the MTCs. So presently, by virtue of 7691, MTCs now can have jurisdiction of even over Action Reinvindicatoria depending on the assessed value of the property. So hindi na exclusive sa RTC ang jurisdiction over Reinvindicatoria. Next, forcible entry and lawful detainer action is and procedurally it is now governed by the rule on summary procedure. Yeah? Rule on summary procedure. That is why the rule on summary procedure is now incorporated in Rule 70. Yeah? The rule on summary procedure is now incorporated in Rule 70. Kasi talagang applicable, exclusively, uh, not exclusively, but applicable ang rule on summary procedure to actions for forcible entry and unlawful detainer. Okay, now, however, the fact that, take note of this, the fact that the rule on summary procedure is now incorporated 
in Rule 7B, 7-0, call will enforceable entry and unlawful detainer actions, it does not mean that the rule on summary procedure exclusively applies to forcible entry and unlawful detainer because the rule on summary procedure likewise applies to ordinary civil actions. Let's say, claim for sum of money up to 200,000. Uh, up to 200,000 summary rules pa rin yan. So, hindi exclusive ang summary rules uh, sa forcible entry and lawful detainer. Pwede pa rin sa ordinary civil action for sum of money up to 200,000. That is for Supreme Court Circular which took effect November of 2002. Next, you may choose forcible entry B. Possessor, you're talking about fiscal possession. The possessor of the property is deprived of his possession by the defendant through fists, force, intimidation, stealth, threat, strategy. So he is ousted, he is deprived of his possession by the defendant through fists. Uh, therefore, uh, in forcible entry, the possession by the defendant of the property is unlawful from the very beginning. He knows it by means of fists. So his possession of the property is unlawful from the very beginning. For an uh, unlawful detainer, uh, the possession is lawful in the beginning. And that why? Because the defendant is allowed to occupy the property, either by virtue of a contract, express or implied. Contract, lease contract, any other contract, huh? allowing him to use the property, or implied, yung a possession by means of tolerance. Huh? Parang binigyan ka ng authority. Now, Therefore, in unlawful detainer, the possession of the real property by the defendant is lawful in the beginning. It becomes unlawful huh, only when the defendant, despite demands upon him to vacate. Kasi pag nag-demand to vacate, terminated na yung authority for him to occupy. Now, if the defendant, despite demand upon him to vacate the property, hindi siya nag-vacate, then his continued possession becomes unlawful. That is now the basis for the unlawful detainer action. Basta tanda nyo, if unlawful detainer, the possession by the defendant na, is lawful in the beginning. It becomes unlawful only after termination of the right to hold possession. But for as long as there is no termination, there is no demand for him to terminate and to vacate, then he can continue occupying. There is no basis for unlawful detainer action. Gets nyo? Kasi pag forcible entry, unlawful from the very beginning. Unlawful detainer, lawful in the beginning, becomes unlawful upon termination of the right to hold possession. When is it deemed terminated? When the owner demands or makes a demand upon him to vacate. Informs him that it is being terminated, I'm withdrawing authority for you, you have to vacate. But for purposes, please, of unlawful detainer action, there must be a demand to vacate. Kasi nga, it is that, uh, when none complied with, it is that which makes it unlawful. That could be the basis for an unlawful detainer action. Gets nyo? Hmm? Okay, now. The filing of a complaint for, complaint ito, no? The filing of a complaint for uh, forcible entries within one year from date of entry. The filing of unlawful detainer is within one year from date of demand. If several demands have been made, it is from the date of last demand. Now please take note, huh? if it is simply a demand to pay rentals in arrears, huh? that is not the demand that is contemplated for purposes of an unlawful detainer action. You know, I was very conscious of this. I dismissed a lot when I was in MTC. 
Because ang ikakabit nila na letter of demand is letter to pay. Ha? Back rentals. This is not the demand that is contemplated. Ha? Failing which na hindi ka magbayad, ha? hindi ka maa-oust. Um, if, if uh, there's a demand to pay, the rentals in arrears, hindi ka nagbayad, ng, eh, hindi ka naghid ng demand, ha? pwede ka file, file na ng collection suit. But not ejectment. Kasi for purposes of an ejectment action and local detainer, there must be a demand to pay. Yun ang importante. Pag hindi ko nakita yan, dinidismiss ko. Huh? Kasi yung mga, that would make it. Huh? That would make your detention or, or your, your, your occupation illegal if you refuse despite the demand. Tinanda lang ka lang ng authority. Kagwinto ko ka pa? Haler. Huh? So, Demand to bake. That is the all-important demand for purposes of unlawful detainer action. Take note of that. Huh? Okay, now, next point. So, since it discovered the Dunan Sawai procedure, summons is served, the defendant is to file the answer within a period of 10 days. Huh? If the defendant fails to file an answer within a period of 10 days reckoned from service of summons, huh, he cannot be declared in default. There is no declaration of default in cases covered by the rule on summary procedure. So what happens if there is no answer, the case will be decided on the basis of the facts as alleged in the complaint. That is under the rules. Walang declaration of default. Huh? Okay, now, if an answer has been filed, then the case will be set for a preliminary conference. Please take note, huh? this is a civil action, and therefore, if it is a civil action covered by the rule on summary procedure, walang hearing. There is no trial, only preliminary conference. After preliminary conference, the parties will be directed to submit within 10 days from receipt of the preliminary conference order their respective position papers setting forth therein the facts and the law relied upon by them in support of their respective causes after which case submitted for decision remember walang hearing if the civil case is covered by the rule on summary procedure it is only if the case is a criminal case covered by the rule on summary procedure that there can be a hearing Ha? Ito, kahit ito special, civil pa rin. Ha? So there is no hearing. Only up to the point of preliminary conference. Next, please, very important, memorize the prohibited pleadings ha? under the rule on summary procedure. You cannot file a motion to dismiss except if the motion to dismiss is founded on lack of jurisdiction and failure to comply with the barangay conciliation requirement. Huh? Marami yan, ano? Call your attention, please, to motion for reconsideration of a judgment. Careful kayo dyan. Hmm? If it is a motion for reconsideration, not every motion for reconsideration is a prohibited pleading under the rule on summary procedure. Ang tatandaan ninyo what is prohibited is a motion for reconsideration of a judgment. Pag sinabi mong judgment, there has already been uh, a consideration of evidence. Of a consideration of evidence on the merits. Yun ang prohibited. But if it is a motion for reconsideration of any order where there has been no determination of the merits of the case, hindi yan prohibited. Huh? That is not prohibited. There's an actual case on that. Uh, I, I cannot mention kasi I was part of it. Uh, uh, no, kasi in friend ko pala, was part of it. Natinulungan ko. Ah, tinulungan ko. <laughs> I, I did tell you this, no? I haven't told you this, no? Yung, uh, my friend judge, summary, we were MPCs there. Na, she, there was failure to file a pleading, which she required the plaintiff to file. Uh, so, she dismissed the case. 
Now she dismissed the case. Wala ka sa pre-trial eh. As sa preliminary conference. Summary rules. She dismissed the case. Ah, okay. The plaintiff filed a motion for reconsideration of the order of dismissal. Ah, okay. Wala kang trial. Ah, she granted the motion for reconsideration. Naturally, the guy can defend that. Dismiss na eh. As this is a case covered by the rule of summary procedure, a motion for reconsideration is a prohibited pleading. Huh? So she was brought, there was a, she was brought to the Supreme Court. Huh? Administrative case. Talaga nag write into an admin case yan. Huh? On the ground of gross ignorance of the law. Huh? Kasi covered by the rule of summary procedure, why did you grant a motion for reconsideration of an order of dismissal? Huh? Order of dismissal. Okay. We racked, racked by our brains. Ah, kasi she was supposed to be promoted already to the RTC. Paano bang gagawin ko dito? Nakahold dito because of this admin case. Sabi ko, i-analyze natin. Ang nakalagay dyan, motion for reconsideration of a judgment. Ang idea ko ng judgment, there has been a consideration, an evaluation on the merits of the evidence presented. Ha? Okay. Iyang order mo, order of dismissal lang yan eh. Ha? You haven't even stepped into preliminary conference. Sabi ko. So, walang consideration. Ha? Walang consideration of the evidence. Nothing whatsoever. Sabi ko, yun na lang ang gamitin natin. Wala nang may isip eh. <laughs> we were sustained. It's in the scrum. We were sustained. And she was promoted. I don't know. It's okay. Ha? But, we were sustained. Ininterpret eh. Ang ponente ng case na yan was Justice Kisunding. Ha? Yung, yun, yung, yung arguments namin, yun ang inada. Ha? When you talk of a judgment, sabi nga yan, it, it deals, it, con, it, it contemplates a situation where there has already been a consideration on the merits of the evidence. Ito nga naman, wala pa eh. Order pa lang yan eh. Ha? Ha? UST thinking yan. Okay. So we were sustained. Ha? Kaya nga sinasabi sa inyo, uh, that is, be careful with that. It is a motion for reconsideration of a judgment that is a prohibited pleading. Hmm? Okay, next point. There is this case, no? Which I think hindi pa lumalabas sa bar. Um, The parties entered into a contract to set. Uh, this is important. The parties entered into a contract to sell and uh, by virtue of the contract to sell, the buyer, the prospective buyer, was allowed, there's a provision in the contract to sell, that uh, he can enter into the property by virtue of the contract to sell. Kasi pag contract to sell, you pay amortizations. Huh? And until complete payment, you will be issued the title. Okay, so, by virtue of the contract to sell, he was able to enter into the premises and occupy it. He failed to pay the amortizations. Uh, when he failed to pay the amortizations, uh, a demand was made upon him to pay and to vacate. Uh, to pay and to vacate. Okay. Uh, when he failed to pay and refused to vacate, the owner, company, filed an action for unlawful detainer. Uh, an action for unlawful detainer. Sustain. MTC, RTC, CA. Ha? Pagdating sa Supreme Court, sabi sa Supreme Court, no. Ha? Why? Ha? Because, take note, ha? hindi when he withdraw, ha? he was simply ordered to vacate because he failed to pay. Eh ano bang basis ng authority niya to occupy? Hindi ba the contract to sell? So the contract to sell was still subsisting. At the time, he was ordered to vacate. He was asked to vacate. So the better thing for you to have done, according to the Supreme Court, was to first rescind the contract to sell. If you rescind the contract to sell, wala na siyang basis to continue holding on to the property. Pag na-rescind yung contract to sell, ha? but the problem is, you immediately ask that he vacate. But he, there is authority to stay and occupy the property is based on the contract to sell. And this is still subsisting when you ask him to back in. Huh? So, the better thing to do is to first rescind the contract to sell. 
pag ni-receive mo, wala na siyang authority to continue, di ba? And then you make a demand. If he does not make, uh, if he does not uh, comply with your demand to vacate, then and only then can you file an unlawful detainer action. Mm-hmm. Huh? That is La Vivo versus CA. Hindi pa naman labas eh. Ang ganda ng case. Now, the judgment rendered in an unlawful detainer action. Talaga. <clears throat> Section 19 says of Rule 70, immediate execution of judgment. Huh? So, immediate execution is favorable to the plaintiff. No? Out you go. Huh? And you can stay that by perfecting an appeal, meaning filing a notice of appeal within a period of 15 days. Diba? Or, and then, uh, post supersedious bond. Ah, okay, post supersedious bond. You can stay. Ah, stay execution of judgment. Now, naka ka. MPC to the RTC. Pending appeal ah, by the RTC. Ah, ang RTC now affirms the judgment of the MPC. Ah, RTC affirms the judgment of the MPC. All cases ito are covered by the rule of summary procedure. Kasama na itong forcible entry and local detainer. Uh, in accordance with Section 19 uh, and uh, Section 21. Uh, so, from the MPC, favorable to the plaintiff, out you go. You appeal, you stay execution, immediate executory death. Stay execution, you can stay. Summary rules. Uh, perfect an appeal, post supersedious bond. Pay rental deposits as may be adjusted in the judgment. Stay my execution. RTC now, on appeal, affirms the decision of the MPC, huh? immediately executory. Question, can you stay execution of the judgment of the RTC on appeal, affirming the judgment of the MPC? Huh? No more stay under Section 21. But you can still appeal. Huh? You can still appeal via petition for review under Rule 42 to the CA. Ulit ha. Ah, uh, tapos na kayo ng civil, ano? Hindi pa? Uh-huh. You're done? O, oh, na-discuss na to, di ba? Sa Rule 42. Appeal, post supersedious bond. 
pay rental deposits as may be a judge in the judgment. Okay, stay. RPC now affirms judgment of the MPC. Huh? The RPC judgment is immediately executory. Huh? Now, di ba meron ka pang right to appeal, further appeal, huh? to the CA. Huh? CA. Under Rule 42. Rule 42 is petition for review. Rule 42. Okay. Magka-appeal ka via a petition for review to the RTC because RTC exercises appeal jurisdiction over the decision of MPC. So, if you go up to the CA, can you stay execution of the judgment of the RTC that is appealed to the CA via a petition for review? No. Uh, because this is covered by the rule on summary procedure. Uh, so, MPC to the RTC, stay. RTC to the CA, no stay. Uh, that, but it is without prejudice to a further appeal to the CA. Uh, however, if it is a case covered by the regular rules, <coughs> Section 8, MPC to the RTC, stay. Uh, post supersedious bond. RTC affirms, go up to the CA, stay. Uh, the judgment of the RTC on appeal, uh, stay. Uh, if you go up to the CA, stay on execution and judgment. Uh, stay it up. By the mere fact of the appeal, unless the CA orders otherwise. Ang mga kalimutan niya, it's very important eh. Stay. Stay. Stay as you are. Stay. MCC, RTC. RTC, CA, no stay. Ha? Okay. Pero then, MCC, RTC, stay. RTC, CA, stay. Unless CA directs otherwise. In nature, and therefore, the petition uh, for contempt it is a petition, no? Therefore, if you don't file any comment, you cannot be declared in default because there is no default in criminal cases. Because in contempt is in the nature of a criminal case. Huh? Okay, you two kinds: direct contempt, indirect contempt. Huh? Careful, kayo dito, kasi pag direct contempt, no need to file petition, kasi. The, the, the contumacious behavior is committed in the presence of or so near the judge. Huh? Okay, so that, they're content. So, you're cited for content. Huh? May imprisonment dyan. Okay, so, walang hearing, summary, citation for content. Because, ni gagawa na in the presence of the judge. Ni babastos na yung judge. Huh? So, it is contumacious behavior committed in the presence of or so near the judge. Huh? Okay, so, walang hearing, summary. Okay, so what is your remedy if there is no hearing? Huh? You cannot appeal from an order of contempt, certiorari. Huh? The remedy is certiorari. Huh? In against an order of direct contempt. Kasi walang hearing yan eh, hindi appealable. So certiorari. That I was cited for contempt with grave abuse of discretion by the judge. Masyag siyang onion skin. Okay, now, on the other hand, 
If the contumacious behavior is not committed in the presence of or so near the judge, for example, may have violation of an order, etc., that is indirect contempt. In which case, it, the, the judge cannot cite a person for indirect contempt without notice and hearing. Huh? Kasi hindi, hindi, hindi ano eh, there ought to be a hearing. Huh? In fact, there should be a petition to be filed. Huh? And please take note, if there's a petition to that, dalawa yan eh, if the judge would want to cite a person for indirect contempt, the judge can do it on its own, or there is a petition to cite a person in indirect contempt. If it is the judge, at the instance of the judge, the person be declared in indirect contempt, the judge will issue a show cause order for him to explain or show cause. At the instance of the judge, to explain or show cause why he should not be cited for contempt, for delaying the proceedings in the case, etc. Okay, now, if it is a contempt at the instance of a party or a third party, kailangan mag-file siya ng petition. Separate petition for indirect contempt and that is treated class as a separate action. Which means that if it is treated as a separate action, once it is filed, huh? once it is filed, it will be given a separate docket number and you have to pay the filing fee. Union. <laughs> you know, bago ngayon eh, you have to file. Dati dati, oh, move, move to declare defendant in, uh, in contempt, your honor, because he failed to comply, etc., etc. Hindi na ngayon. Huh? If it is indirect contempt, you have to file a petition. Tapos ha, ah, ira-raffle off yan. Because it's an independent action. It will be raffled off. But you can ask for a consolidation of that particular separate indirect contempt with the case huh? before the judge who's against whom huh, the con contumacious behavior was committed. For example, yung judge na yung order na ano, hindi ka nag-comply sa order. Huh? I mean, if the, you cannot, uh, jurisprudence says, the judge to whom the indirect contempt petition has been raffled, will not be in a position to to actually determine, huh? will not be in a position to actually determine if this violation actually was consummation, if it is against, huh? against the particular judge. Kasi ang, ang act was directed against an order of that judge. Huh? So the judge to whom, who is a different judge, to whom the petition for indirect contempt huh? was filed, may forward it to that judge. Kasi you will not be in a position to determine whether or not. Huh? Eh kasi, there are some cases na on your skin, and judge, iba naman, ang kapal. <laughs> diba? So, mas mabuti, sabi nga yan, pwede yan eh, huh? you ask for the consolidation with the case pending uh, before the same judge whose order has been violated. But, uh, remember that indirect contempt kailangan merong notice and hearing. If it is, uh, therefore, if it requires notice and hearing and a judgment for indirect contempt is rendered, that the remedy is appeal. Huh? Pero in direct contempt, huh, since there is no appeal, summary yan, ang citation, the, 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 the remedy is certiorari, grave abuse of discretion. In direct contempt, there is notice and hearing, huh? it is not... Uh, it is not, uh, the consummation behavior is not made in the presence of or so near the judge. The remedy is appeal. Ayan, no? Who can punish for contempt? No other court other than the one who was condemned. Huh? There will be hearing. Okay, remedy. The power of contempt is judicial in nature unless other agencies are specifically authorized by a law. Uh, unless other agencies are specifically authorized by a law. And Katandanya, as far as contempt is concerned, verified petition, you will not be asked in the bar what will be the penalty in case of imprisonment. Kasi may imprisonment, kasi nga, criminal in nature. Okay, so uh, we'll stop there. I'll meet you for the final lecture. Not on Friday, ah. Uh, it's Tuesday. Uh, kasi 
I'll be I'll be going to Cebu Friday for another lecture. Hmm? Uh, so spectro na tayo, no? Spectro. Sige. Then for example, spreading for the part